All right, it looks like we've got everyone here other than Gary at the moment. Andy, do you know if, if Gary's planning to join us? I believe so, yes. Okay, so he might just be running a little bit late. I'll give him another 30 seconds or so. I've texted him. He might be having some difficulty joining. Fair enough. No, thank you for that. All right. Well, it's 6.31, so um, we'll get cracking and hopefully Gary will better join us very soon. Um, so for the benefit of the public, I'm Councillor Andy Konieczko, the Vice Chair of the Economic Planning and Housing Committee. And I'm going to be chairing tonight's meeting as Councillor Stuart Frost isn't able to make it so he's unwell. I'd like to welcome everyone to the meeting, which is being held virtually and in accordance with the Council's rules for virtual meetings, which reflect the recently published government regulations. The meeting is being streamed live on YouTube and will also be available to view after the meeting has finished. Councillors who sit on this committee are identified by name on the screen and I'll introduce the officers by name before they address the committee. Councillors are reminded that although this meeting is being held remotely, they are regarded as being present in a meeting of the Council and they should therefore observe the normal rules of behaviour using the member code of conduct and not allow members of their household to distract them during the course of the meeting. Can members please ensure that their mobile phones are either now switched off or are turned to silent, please. Members of the committee will turn on their video link during the meeting and keep their microphones muted unless they've been invited to speak by me as the chair. Members are reminded that if they switch off their video link or move away from the camera, they'll be treated as leaving the meeting I will not be able to take part in any vote taken on that item under discussion. Members can indicate that they wish to speak by raising their virtual hand and should only speak when I, as the chair, invite them to do so. The officers present will only switch on their video link during, <coughs> excuse me, during the item that they are presenting or where they wish to be invited to speak by me as chair. As chair, I'll confirm the name of any visiting speaker at the appropriate time in the agenda and they'll then address the committee by audio link. Councillors should declare that they are leaving the meeting and switch off their video link if they have a disclosable pecuniary interest or any other personal interest in an item on the agenda. The councillors can switch on their video link when I call the next agenda item. Voting will be taken by roll call. I don't think this applies to us tonight, but I will, I'll read it nonetheless. And I'll confirm the recommendation proposed to the committee before the voting begins. Can each member indicate whether they are for or against the recommendation or whether they wish to abstain? Hopefully we will not have any IT problems, but I can, um, can I please remind councillors that if their connection is lost, they should immediately advise the Democratic Support Officer and use their meeting link to access the meeting again. OK, so hopefully that's all clear. I'm just checking his... Gary has joined us. Welcome, Gary. Thanks for joining us. It's good. So we've got a full house. Um, so if we go through the agenda, so item number one, apologies for absence and substitutions. Well, as I mentioned at the start, Councillor Frost is unwell, so isn't able to join us. It doesn't look like there are any other absences or substitutions, but um, I will just for the record ask. No, good. Um, item number two, declarations of interest. Does anyone have any items to declare? No, fantastic. I urgent matters, item number three. I'm not aware of any urgent matters. Julia, has anything come in at the last minute? No. Great. OK, so we are uh, tearing through this agenda very quickly. Um, item number four, minutes of the meeting held on the 6th of January. Um, obviously, as this was only a week ago, those minutes aren't ready yet, so um, we can't vote on those. Which brings us on to item five, which I suspect is what's going to take the vast majority of our discussion this evening. The uh, AMR, the Authority Monitoring Report for Planning for 2020-21. Um, we do have some speakers for this agenda item, but before we do that, I'd like to introduce Joanne Bromley, who will speak very briefly about this paper. So, Jo, over to you. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, Committee. I've just got literally a couple of slides um, just to go through as an introduction. So, Mark is 
Kathy going to put those up for me? Okay, Mark, so if you want to go to the first slide. Thank you. So yeah, just the introduction, as most of you will know, this is about the authority monitoring report, which is a statutory document that we produce as a local planning authority. We do it every year and it's something that we have to do legally in terms of the regulations. It monitors all sorts of things we're planning related, including sort of, um, progress on planning documents, our duty to cooperate processes and things like that. But mostly really it's about monitoring the performance of planning policies that we've got at the council. So that's really monitoring the adopted local plan and also 10 neighbourhood plans. So those are the plans that have been in place for over a year now. So it looks at all of those areas. It's already been published. So it was published in December, just before Christmas. So the report really is for noting, but obviously we will want to discuss the content of that as we move through the agenda. I think probably the headline that I just wanted to raise really was that it's a continuation probably of the picture that we've had over the last couple of years, the last year particularly. So just picking up on, on a few of those elements, I think overall it's a positive picture in terms of the policies providing the clear framework that we need to make consistent planning decisions and also have making positive decisions in terms of the social, economic um, and, and environmental well-being of the borough. It's also meeting our sort of needs and priorities in many respects. So I've just summarised here some of the, the positive elements of it. So again, we've had very high housing delivery over the monitoring year, and that's for the third year um, on the trot, over 1,200 dwellings. So over that three year period, we've had a four, nearly 4,000 homes that have been delivered in the borough. We've had a suitable mix of houses. So when I say that, it's sort of a mix in terms of size. So majority of two and three bed houses, but also other size um, houses to meet needs. And also the plan has been effective in securing 40% affordable housing as well. So in terms of, sort of tenure split, so we're picking that up. It's very much providing flexibility. So enabling suitable development in the countryside. And you will see from looking through the report that there were a large number, for example, of rural economy sort of applications, which helped to, to boost the rural economy, which have been allowed under this agenda. Suitable levels of housing, which meet particular needs, etc. So it's providing that flexibility where it's needed, but at the same time also protecting the natural environment across the board in terms of our green infrastructure network, designated areas that we've got, uh, and other issues as well, avoiding floodplains, etc. It's also preventing loss of key facilities, as well as that also helping to provide new facilities in the right place by providing the right framework. And the other thing I just wanted to draw attention to was the ongoing improvement in the level of design. So we do assess completed um, developments in terms of phasing or complete completions, in terms of how well they're doing against the criteria, the building for a healthy life criteria. And there's been a continuing increase in good and very good scores for that. And this year, we've actually had three schemes which had a very good score um, in Overton, Sherbourne, St John, and also Bramley. So they're worthy of note, I think, because prior to this year, we've only had two schemes that met that level. Mark, if you wanted to go to the next one, thank you. But I also wanted to highlight that there were four targets that haven't been met. And these are shown on the RAG rating um, table that we've got at the beginning of the actual authority monitoring report itself. They're shown up as red. Continuing again, sort of last trends really from the last few years that we still do not have a five-year housing land supply, although it's slightly better than before. It's only marginally better and it still sits at 4.5 years. So there are still issues and obviously the, <clears throat> all the implications of that remain in place that many of you will be familiar with. Chips in travel accommodation, we also have a requirement to have five year supply of pictures for that as well, which we also have not met. There is progress on the number of the housing allocations, because you will recall our local plan strategy is to put pictures on our larger strategic allocations. And we now, either now for in the monitoring period or since, we've got eight pictures that have outlined planning permission, which will help move us along in terms of meeting that five year supply. Meeting self-build requirements, so there's a legal requirement, again, to meet needs which are highlighted on our brownfield, uh, sorry, our self-build register. So there's a requirement there for 85 plots, 
we only managed to meet the need for 60. So we have that ongoing sort of demand of 25 plots, which will be rolled over. So there's that issue. And the last one that I just wanted to highlight was job creation. And this isn't a continuation of trend. Whereas in the past we've had growth. Now the data is showing that there was a decline in employment levels, but this was over the period 2020, uh, 2019 to 2020 and very much reflected the impact of COVID-19 and all that that gave in terms of unemployment, et cetera. And we would expect that to bounce back now as we move out, hopefully, out of, out of the pandemic. So those are just things I wanted to highlight in advance. Thank you very much, Joe. OK, in which case we'll now move on to the speakers. We have three speakers this evening, um, one councillor and two members of the public. Um, given that there's only three speakers, I'm going to use my discretion as chair to um, allow questions of the, the speakers at the end of each um, interval uh, when, when the speaker has spoken. Um, I would, though, ask members to please be mindful of the fact that we've got quite a long agenda to, uh, this evening. So, so please be um, cognizant of that when you ask your questions. OK, so our first speaker is Councillor Onnelly Cubitt, who I hope is on the line. Onnelly, are you there? I am. Can you hear me? We can, loud and clear. So as a councillor, <laughs> as you know, Onnelly, you have four minutes and those four minutes will begin now. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, members. Um, please note that I'm speaking tonight in my capacity as councillor and not member. <laughs> This document is a very, very important one to us all. It is a balance sheet vis-a-vis uh, -vis our planning. It is a snapshot end of March each year for the year before, which determines the future of our borough and our residents. And it provides the route map on development. It is basically um, marking the homework on the performance of this cabinet and this administration. I'm going to talk about two issues that are of grave concern to me and demonstrate in my belief a complete failing on the part of the cabinet and of the administration. The first is extant figures. I believe that the housing supply figure calculation is highly subjective. There is a swathe of extant figures which are not included in the five year housing supply. And I believe it is subjective to choose those that have not been included. So the 2021 figure for extant consents was 4,361 of which 1,145 dwellings have been excluded from our five-year housing supply. And these sites were excluded by officers from Hampshire County Council and Basingstoke and Dean, and I'm advised that there are five of them. I've gone through the five and I've actually calculated that it doesn't come to 1,145, but actually 743 dwellings, which would give me a further 402 of the extants that could be included, which when deducted from the shortfall of 436, means that actually our house uh, supply shortage is actually only 34 dwellings. And in any event, as I said, the evaluation is highly subjective, plus the report states at times of high delivery, it negatively impacts on supply as the supply has been used up much more quickly. And as you all know, in the past three years, we've been delivering significantly more than 850. And as you all know, also additionally, many down has now been finally added to Appendix 3, and that has some huge impact. And so therefore, whilst this report re makes reference to the self-builds um, being only a temporary situation, the same is true of the housing supply. And yet we are scorching the earth, scorching our borough on the basis of these temporary situations. The second issue I want to talk about is water quality. The water quality has deteriorated to poor, poor, fail. The policy requires us not, uh, not just to prevent a change in band status, but to protect, manage and improve the water cycles, uh, water quality. Um, our policy also states that should the monitoring indicate there's likely to be a, deter a deterioration in individual elements, then SS4 in the local plan policy will prevent further development, which exacerbates such deterioration. And uh, the council seems to state that the environment agency has said, oh, don't worry, the individual element ban status hasn't been, deterioration hasn't been caused by development and therefore we can just carry on uh, regardless. Um, uh, one there minute. also, one more minute. So I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to take questions, but I, I, I think this is a damning indictment on the cabinet and on this administration. These, uh, this situation is, is, is something that were we to have a different leadership uh, could have been addressed and the blight that is happening in all our parishes, I hold uh, fully responsible at the feet of the political administration that we currently have. Thank you very much. 
Okay, as I said, very happy for us to have some questions for on Lisa. Is anyone want to ask a question? Councillor McCormick. Thank you, Chair. I have three, if you'll indulge me. I'll be quick. I will, if you can keep them brief, that will be incredibly helpful. Right. So, firstly, Councillor Cubitt, you mentioned that the housing supply figures were highly subjective. Um, what evidence do you have in terms of the decision making to back that up? Um, second one, water quality you mentioned has deteriorated. Um, to what degree has it deteriorated? And do you have anything um, to support that? Uh, and the third one, in terms of the cabinet and different leadership, what do you see as the solution for that? Thank you. Right. Um, so the first question was in terms of my statement that it's highly subjective. I sent a, 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 an email, an email to the um, to the officers asking uh, 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 about the number of the extants that had been included in the five year housing supply calculation and the number that had not. And I was advised that 1,145 of the 4,361 had not. Uh, they, I then went back and asked officers if they could advise what sites do these extant figures that have been excluded from the five year relate to. I then said who determined that they could not be included in our five year housing supply. And then thirdly, I asked what does this council need to do to get those extant figures included in our housing supply? Because as all of you members know, um, we haven't had a housing supply since April 2019, which would have fed into the annual monitoring report 2020. And uh, it has had very grave uh, an impact on our borough. So the answer that came back to those questions were that um, listed in Appendix 3, there are five sites. Uh, and then I was given the five sites, namely Lamb Beh between Elm Dean and Fairhome Tadley. They sit Golf Course, Hanson Fields, Andover Road, Oakley, and Faulkner Road, Kingsclare. Now, when I looked at Appendix 3 and calculated the figures, I calculated that those um, uh, uh, sites, even if officer's decision is correct, and who am I to say it is or not, because we all know push-pull, you get fast delivery, you get acceleration, and you get breaks um, from each individual developer. But quite a few of those sites are very small, 11 and 13, a couple are big. And I only calculated that um, there were 740 houses uh, that um, could conceivably be uh, uh, on the basis of this subjective analysis that the developer won't develop them within the five year plan. Uh, and um, uh, as I said to you, um, who, who's to know whether that, that those, 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 those evaluations are correct. Now, the officers will say to you, inspectors have evaluated the phasing as well. And I'm not professing to be an expert, but on the basis of the words in Appendix 3, it doesn't leave me comfortable. Second question you uh, raise is the one about water. We had a meeting in, I think, February, March 2021 as members at a map. We were supposed to be presented the water cycle study, uh, which was supposed to have been concluded in February 2021. Uh, we did not get the water cycle study, but we did have the consultants there and the environment agency. And I have in front of me, but you can't see because I'm on um, oral, not um, uh, film. But um, uh, on the classifications, overall water body in 2019, poor, uh, biological poor, poor, chemical fail, priority hat fail. And these had deteriorated from moderate in 2016 to poor in 2019. So there'd been a huge sw swivel on the dial, right? And then overall water body status, it was moderate in 2016, it went to poor in 2019. So there's significant evidence and, uh, but what's even more important, Councillor McCormick, is that we're supposed to have data every year. And I made a reference to the fact we're working on March, 2020, one theoretically but in the case of the water quality it's even worse than that we don't have according to this annual monitoring report any data past 2019 so the environment agency hasn't given us and i will remind all of you councillors this is an audit of our homework right and in our plan policy in uh, em6 of the current approved local plan you will note it states that the status of the water environment is monitored and that the, an, the environment agency's annual monitoring process must take place, right? So 
Sorry, Animal can I change you a bit? Could, could I ask you just, just to stick to the answer to the question? So we, we, we have further questions for you. We do okay, sorry, I apologise. But that, that, there was a connection to that because of, um, we're working on very, very old data. And we know that thousands more houses have been built since that very old data was submitted and that there's a Noted. bit. Okay, and then the last point was, what do I think we can do about it? I despair, I'm almost in tears, Councillor McCormick, and I don't know the answer because, you know, we're about to... Uh, go back to our residents and do I, can I hand on heart believe, state to my residents that I believe I've done to the best of my ability what I was elected to do for my residents, which is to make Basingstoke a better place to live in and to protect uh, the environment. And when, when Jo and her team, who are brilliant, go through the positives, the problem is, is that I'm not sure, um, I mean, you know, um, uh, I'm not sure that that we can truly say that we have been protecting the natural environment. Um, I, I, I don't know on what basis um, Joe can say that this administration has fulfilled that. But what I do know is that on the um, category she says we failed, the knock-on effect of those failures are so um, uh, overwhelming uh, for all of our residents. Um, it, 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 it is uh, truly depressing. And finally, I just want to say, um, the rags, I think, are very uh, disingenuous. Um, I believe that the water quality one should definitely be a red uh, rag status. Uh, I, thank you. Sorry, Audley. I have to cut you off there. I'm, I'm sure councillors will, will raise questions about that when, when we get to that point. But I, I, I appreciate you, you making the point there. Um, if we move on to Councillor Mahaffey, you've got your hand up next. Thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor McCormack's actually asked the question I was going to ask, which was the um the, the the evidence for the uh the, the subjective quality of some of the conclusions but if i can kind of add a supplemental which isn't really directed at you on but if i can direct to the officers could we uh not within this meeting but afterwards have a little bit more information about the decision making process that has surrounded those three sites that on lee has highlighted um because uh it would be it's not something I'd considered before, to be honest. It would be very useful to, to spend some time thinking about it. Thank you, Simon. Joe, is that something you can look into after the meeting? Yeah, that's fine. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. And the final hand is from Councillor Laura James. Laura. Thank you. Um, I guess uh, Andy's raised a lot of the questions that I wanted to ask. I suppose in looking at the egg stand, you're saying, Lee that there's now it's not the 1145 it's what 700 and your calculation is 743 in relation to those sites that you've been given in appendix three what were the reasons why they're not or I mean, we can ask the officers this as well but what why why haven't they come forward uh, and why aren't they being considered as part of the five-year housing land supply? And what's your concerns about that, I suppose? Right, so just, just to correct, the 700 figure that I calculated on the back of a fag packet, and as I said, I'm a layman, I'm, you know, I'm not a, an expert, but when I went through Appendix 3, that's what I calculated. That's the number that could conceivably be considered as not to be included. So I then deducted... 740 for them, 1,145. That's the first answer. But uh, your second question is, is, is well made. And the answer is when I read the verbiage on the columns, it's, you know, it, 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 how long's a piece of string? It's very difficult to predict when developers are going to uh, develop sites. And, 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 and we all know that the developers play games with Basingstoke and know where our local plan is and the timing of our local plan. And they know when to put their foot on the brakes and they know when to put their foot on the accelerator. And uh, I, I, I said about the many down figure, I mean, honestly, you know, if we were to look at this in a couple of months time, if many down starts looking like it's gonna have a faster build out rate, we'd suddenly be protected. But by then we'd have, committed harakiri in relation to accepting uh, huge numbers, uh, blighting more sites that didn't need to be blighted, etc. Thank you, Ollie. And I think, Joe, if, if, if possibly as part of that, that work that you're doing, if, if you're able to perhaps look into this discrepancy um, uh, and, and, and this sort of the, this, this gap in the numbers, that would be so I don't think it's something we, we can attempt to, to try and clarify tonight. But um, 
if that could be investigated, that would be helpful for us. Can I just That's ask fine. I, mean, I can <clears throat> sort of provide an answer as well if the committee wants in due course up to you, Chair. Yeah, no, it, 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 I think if we, let's, let's look into that as, as part of this additional piece of work. So I think it, 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 um, it feeds into that. Can I just ask, it's another question of Anneli, it's just the last one. It's, okay. You make reference in relation to the RAG rating. In relation to the water quality, looking at that, uh, which is in grey at the moment. Sorry, okay. Captain Laura. Can, can I ask that, that we, um, we we come on to the RAG rating um, when, when, we, when we go through to that table? No, no I, was unless, gonna, unless I, yeah, I was going to ask. Sorry, I was going to ask. I was going to ask questions about the water. What it says so in relation to uh, the water. It, it talks about that. Well, all can, can we, if we can come back, if, if it's a question specifically for Onley, that's fine. Let's ask that now. If it's a question more about the table, if we yeah. can tackle that when we get to the table, that'll be. No, that'll it's, be... it's about in, in in Onley in relation to the water quality. Okay. So what I'm asking at Onley is in in relation to it says that. Um, that all water bodies in England flout the chemical status. And then it goes on to talk about um, also in relation to 2019 due to biological quality elements. And I remember this in relation to the policy that we looked at, talking about fish. Could you just talk to me about that in relation to the lot and what, what this report is saying here? Well, I, I don't think that that synopsis is a fair analysis of the briefing that we had last year, and I don't think it's a fair um, synopsis, and that I'll leave it at that, but basically it doesn't seem to be just about the fish. I think that's to trivialise the situation, and as I cannot emphasise enough to you guys, this is marking our homework, this is now, we're 2022, we're supposed to be working off 2020 data, and this, this, this stuff is working off 2019. Thanks. As I said, I'm in tears, to be honest. I'm, I despair of our borough, not the officers, but the administration. I'm distraught about the direction of travel, and I'm distraught about the fact that um, uh, these um, uh, annual monitoring report does not um, does not meet the needs of our residents. Thank you. Thank you, Ollie. As, as an opposition councillor, I should say I, I have a, a very strong incentive to allow you to continue and speak for as long as you want. But I, as, as chair of the meeting, I, I think we'll, we'll, we'll call it a day there. So thank you very thank much you. for uh, for coming to speak to us this evening. OK, so we'll move on to our next speaker. Sorry, can, uh, Laura, if you wouldn't mind just putting your hand down, that would be helpful. Thank you. So we've got two members of the public who will each have two minutes. And the first one I've got is Kate Tuck from Solve. Kate, are you there? I am. Can you hear me? We can, loud and clear. So you have two minutes and I will let you know when you have 30 seconds of your allotted time remaining. And those two minutes begin now. Thank you. We cannot pick and choose which policies and which laws we are going to abide by. That gets you into hot water. The River Loddon is not meeting le the legal requirement of the Water Framework Directive, which says it must achieve good status. We all agreed that the water quality of the Loddon has deteriorated from moderate to poor. Therefore, if we are applying a RAG status consistently, this logically must be marked red in the AMR. Charles Rangely Wilson, the author of the Carver Chalk Stream Restoration Strategy, yesterday said of the Loddon, the fact it is not achieving good status is related to the intensity of land use and urban development. We know that more houses or people, more abstraction, more runoff, more sewage. The sewage treatment works has a theoretical assessed capacity for an indicative population of 144,000. However, it is not coping with the current population on, oh, I think it was 17 days of the year last year when raw sewage was pumped into the river. So this indeed remains theoretical. In 6.23, you say that the borough's water environment is protected and monitored to ensure that there is no deterioration in quality. My question is, what are you doing about this deterioration and how will you achieve good status? I remind the borough that it has a legal responsibility to monitor water quality annually, as stated in the planning inspector's report. We know sensors have been removed and no data will mean that the precautionary principle will need to kick in. The EA has moved to triennial reportering according to the AMR. What will you do to comply with your legal responsibility for annual monitoring? Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Kate. Um, any questions for Kate? Councillor McCormick. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think I speak for probably all of us about the concerns we have about the, uh, the discharge of raw sewage into the River Lodden. Um, even Thames Water itself says it's unacceptable. Um, the problem that we have is that we don't have any local accountability from Thames Water. Um, so my question uh, to you, Kate, uh, as part of Solve is, um, what do you want us to do as a council in terms of future development or the local plan um, to give um, the best outcome, bearing in mind that we might not be able to deliver um, a sufficiently good outcome given the constraints we're under? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor McCormick. I would really love you to provide very, very strong river policies for all our chalk rivers across the board. I want them all treated fairly. I would like us to have very strong, robust river policies and they're to cover the river catchments. Because of course, you know, the groundwater filters through that filters into the rivers and our combined sewers, it's a complex, problem that's why it's difficult to answer individually very nitty gritty bits but if we can have very strong and robust river policies that will give us a defense mechanism against if there is unsuitable development some development will be an amazing thing for this borough but it needs to be the right thing in the right place and at the right time thank you kate um Joe, am I right in thinking, I'm sure I read somewhere that we are looking at drafting river policies as part of the local plan updates, is that correct? Yes, and we've got a couple of policies already on water quality, so we're looking to update those, and yes, also looking at new, new policies, looking at the actual river corridors themselves. Okay, That's, uh, hopefully that, that helps address that issue, at least to some degree, Kate. Thank you, Joe, for that. Um, Councillor Laura James. Thank you. Kate, you talked about uh, in relation to census and, and, and monitoring of, of the river. I thought that we had some gauges or something that were there to do that as part of this process. Do we not have any sort of monitoring of the river at all? So from my conversations with the Environment Agency, we had paid for some gauges to be uh, at Pyatt's Bridge and Round Cops. Apparently, just, who you say we, as in, is that the council? Oh, uh, oh actually, yes, it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, I'm yeah. just checking. It's the royal we. Yeah, that's, that's good. That's good. Thank okay. you. So the council had paid the Environment Agency for five-year contract, and as I understood it, the gauges were removed last autumn because uh, they had never worked. And in any case, you've come to the end of our contract and now we're removing them. And I think, and I'm not sure, I would welcome input from anyone who can, can help. I thought that now the Environment Agency is monitoring, or Thames Water is monitoring on behalf of the Environment Agency above and below the sewage treatment plant. And I don't know about you, but I'm a little uneasy about, um, about the water company being the one that's responsible for monitoring. But um, okay. thanks, Dick. Can, can any, <laughs> any of the officers do they, do they know the answer to that question or what's happening at the moment, Joe? Um, I've not personally been involved in the conversations, but I have seen correspondence from the EA because it came from the EA about removing those gauges, um, and, and they were supportive of, of not having those anymore because they had adequate other means to monitor. So it came from them, which we then agreed to. What were the what were they? What were the adequate means? Sorry, to sorry, Councillor James, I missed that. What were the adequate means to uh, measure the? I don't know the details. I say I've not been involved in the conversation, so I don't know the details of how, of how they're monitoring it instead. But I've seen the correspondence that they felt like they were no longer needed to do that adequately. Okay, thank you, Joe. Thank you, Laura, and thank you, Kate, as well, for joining us this evening. Really appreciate that. Thank you. So we'll move on to our final speaker, who is Peter Bloyce, who's also from Solve. So Peter, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? 
We can, yes. There's a bit of a delay, but we, uh, we, we've got you, which is the most important thing. I so, was a bit worried. I had some technical issues. Um, no problem. Well, you've got two minutes. I'll let you know when there's 30 seconds of your time remaining and your two minutes begin now. Yeah, um, this is also on behalf of Old Basin and Litchbit Parish Council, where I'm the um, chairman of the planning uh, committee of that. Um, Understood. Yeah, my, today my comments refer to the five-year housing supply, that's the AMR para 5.2. The delays in many down are putting pressure on greenfield sites all over the borough. However, just as important is the rich, rigid application of government guidelines, which forces the council to use an ill-suited algorithm to calculate the housing requirements. We continue to use the seven-year-old 2014 baseline, but by using the and adjusting for 2018 figures, we get 342 dwellings per annum, even lower than um, on these calculations. Hampshire CPRE have come up with the same figure. This is quite a difference from the 900 in the AMR. How ridiculous! You are working with a system that is no longer fit for purpose and using old data. A good example of rubbish in, rubbish out. Several councils throughout the UK are lobbying the government to change the top-down approach in favour of local solutions. Seven parishes in Wildon, East Sussex, have written to Michael Gove asking for, and I quote here, the immediate abandonment of the current punitive algorithm forcing building on greenfields in unsuitable locations. I understand there is further delay in the local plan, Schedule 18. Enough time to adjust your figures and hopefully take account of a government rethink. I have just become aware of an email response to, to Kate, who's just spoken, Solve Chair of, of, from Councillor Bound. Sorry, can I ask you to wrap up, please? Yeah, it does strike a positive note. And we are grateful for this and the exploration of exceptional circumstances. However, this is not enough if the government continues to, with the top-down standard approach. Decisions must be made locally. It is the only answer. And forget silly things like capital of the South. Thank That's you very much, Peter. Any questions from members for Peter? No. OK. In that case, Peter, thank you again for, for joining us. Um, uh, very welcome to, to, to watch the, the remainder of the meeting. OK, so that's it now in terms of our speakers. So thank you for that. And thank you also for, for keeping your questions brief. I really do appreciate that. Um, we've got a lot on our plate. So we're going to move in, in, into the main substance of the document now. But I'm going to propose that we jump around a little bit through the pack. And there is some method to my madness, as you'll hopefully see when I explain what, what we're going to try and do. So I'm going to suggest that we leave the introduction to the agenda, so um, pages 5 to 15 of the pack to the end, as a lot of the content is going to be covered in the main document, and that's where I'd like us to focus our time. If we haven't covered something that's in the introduction, if there's something that you, that you think we've missed that you want to pick up on, um, then we can come back to that at the end, but I'm confident that we'll, we'll pick up on most of the issues. That said, I'm just going to contradict myself very briefly because there was a point that I did want to make um, about a specific discrepancy. And that's if you look at page um, eight of the document, paragraph 3.1, the second bullet point, it talks there about policies continue to be effective in securing 40% affordable housing on the majority of qualifying sites, so on the majority of qualifying sites there. Whereas if you go to the table in the main bit of the report, so it's the table which is on page 24 of the pack um, the second row from the bottom it talks about the council secured compliant affordable housing for all of the qualifying schemes so I just wanted the officers to clarify because that's sort of quite an important point um, whether it was the majority or whether it was all I can respond on that one. So in terms of the AMR, where it says that all of the qualifying schemes have met the 40%, that's correct statement. So they did. So there were two qualifying sites that did that. Yep. In terms of the statements that are in the actual report itself, they're more general. So where it says in particular, the 
the borough's planning policies are. So it's really continuing the trend of the fact that they are continuing to do the majority. So it wasn't a specific comment for this year. It, it's a more general comment. OK, Absolutely. thank you very much. OK, so in that case, we'll, we'll move on to, to, to the, the main documents. And that's the table starting on page 22 and also sections five, six, seven and eight. Um, before we go into that, can I just ask that we very quickly go through sections one to four, as I suspect that we can do this very quickly. So if we can go to section one, which is on page 34 of the main pack or page 18, if you're looking at the, the small numbers. Sorry, so say, that, say that again, sorry. So if you go to page 34, of the big numbers or page 18 of the, the small right. numbers, which is, it says section yeah. one introduction. Yeah. So if we can go there, do we, does anyone have any comments on section one? No, good. Section two, which is page 35 or page 19, key contextual characteristics of Basingstoke and Dean. No. Section three, progress with planning documents, local development scheme on page 38 or little page 22. And obviously there is a section, sorry, that's, uh, yeah, there's a section in there about SIL, but we'll go on and talk about that later on. So I'm hoping we can cover off that there. I'd, sorry. Yeah. Councillor Laura Jones. Yeah, so I, that's in relation to page 36. I, I suppose, and I don't know whether it's picked up earlier later on, um, but it's... Is this, it, sorry, this, this on, on section five, or is it little is page on, 36 or big page 36? Sorry, Laura. Big page 36. Yeah. That's about housing affordability, prices and rents. Yes. Um, <clears throat> and, just, and I don't know whether you can pick this up, Joe, or whether this has to be housing, but um, in relation to the price, the increase in um, the rented sector um, and whether we need to do a piece of work as, as a committee about that, um, 2.7. And, and just, um, is that what that's saying? It's saying that Am I reading that right in relation to the costings of that? And I, and I was just wondering in relation to everything that we're about in how it impacts on people, the private rented sector and how expensive it is still. So is the piece of work that you're referring to is, is how the increases in cost is how that's impacting on the borough? Yes, yeah, yeah. And, and what we can do about it, you know, because obviously those people are not going to be housed through the register at the moment um and I ju it's just really on top of everything else that they're going to face this year in relation to other life costs that are going to go on and we're all aware about is and and if you look at shelter and what they're saying about poverty housing costs is the contributing factor and and it clearly is it is still a significant issue for people in Basingstoke and Dean and I think it's maybe something that we as a committee need to look at in a bit more detail. We are having a housing needs assessment sort of completed as part of the evidence space for the local plan, which looks at exactly that. So we, we can share that and we are sharing that with the housing team for kind of more short term impacts. But obviously we're looking at it as well in terms of our policy development for the local plan to see what we can do with that. So it is a piece of work that's sort of happening. Right. Thanks, Joe. Thank you, Laura. So if we move on to section three on big page 38, little page 22, going all the way through. to page 50 or page 34, section four, duty to cooperate. No, okay, great. In that case, we'll get on to the table then. So, if I can ask you to call up the table, which is on page 22, and we'll go through the table line by line, but we'll also refer to the relevant paragraphs 
in sections five, six, seven and eight. Um, so if we begin with that first line of the table, number of new homes built, and that if cross references to section 5.1 um, on page, big page 52, little page 36. So does anyone have any questions relating to that first line of the table or anything um, at, on or, or beyond page 52 stroke 36, number of homes built? So we've got a couple of hands up, um, Laura. Before I, I, I do have questions on that, but if I could just talk about, and I don't know if you want me to talk about it at this stage, because you said no, but I wanted to talk about the RAG rating. Let's, let, if, 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 if there's a specific issue with one of the, the, the points, Laura, if we, if we can cover it then, do you, do you have an issue with this specific one being green or is it a bit further down? Than no, you've got no, it's, it's, no, it's further down. So let, let's take that up then. What page, you know. Sorry, what page are we are on the main report? We're on page... We're, we're on, on the table page 22 and we're report page 52, 36, all the way through to um, 56, 40. So 50, 52 to 56 are the big pages or 36 okay. to 40 yeah. are the small pages. Do you have any questions on that, Laura? I do, but I'll come back if that's okay. Yeah, no problem. We've got a couple of other councillors with their hands raised. So, Andy. Thank you, Chair. Um, just some clarification on the figures, really. So you've got net completions and well, net new dwellings and gross new dwellings. So um, am I right in interpreting gross as being properties that have been built or converted and net um, is taken into account uh, where we have, uh, well, so I mean, gross is just like the new properties, whether they're built or converted, and and a net um, takes into account properties that have been demolished and not replaced. Would I be right in making in interpreting that that way? And also um, picking up on the, there was a question I wanted to ask in general of officers about the um, assertion by Councillor Cubit that housing supply figures were highly subjective uh, because that. Um, raises a little question mark over me on the figures themselves uh, and, and I wanted to understand uh, maybe we'll get the emails released on this uh, for the committee to look at um, why it is that uh, Councillor Cubitt might think that the supply figures are highly subjective uh, and why they should be called into question. Thank you Joe. Um I'll let you answer just just for us so on, on that second point about the subjective figures. If if that's going to be covered in the 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 response that you've already been asked to provide, then it, it may be something that that we wait for that. But I'll I'll let you decide as, as to whether that's something that's 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 worth discussing in this meeting now. Okay. <clears throat> in terms of the difference between the net and gross, it is exactly as you kind of explained at the at the end of how you explained it, <laughs> Councillor McCormack, in the fact that the gross is all of the new all of the new homes. In, in whatever form, when you get the nets, that's basically taken off all the, all the units that were demolished. So you do lose, obviously, some through redevelopment, et cetera. So that's, that's literally the difference between the two. I'm quite happy to come back on the kind of assertion, really, in terms of the, the process. It is actually a really detailed process that officers go through in terms of, of looking at phasing, which is very much in line with government guidance in terms of, of how you do it. So there is a definition um, in the MPPF in terms of what you can include and what you can't include in your five-year supply. So for example, um, any small sites with permission, you can include larger sites, which have full permission, you can include. For sites which, have, which are allocated in a plan or which only have outline permission, you then have to show clear evidence that there is progress on that site and that it is coming forward. And that is something that we've been tested at appeal quite strongly a number of times at recent appeals where you go through this almost on a site by site basis looking at it. So what we do do as part of this process is that we contact developers and promoters of, of every large site that makes up the supply and ask them for how they see sites coming forward in terms of delivery rates. So that takes account of phasing and things and how those sites are, are going to come forward. And the government guidance is very clear that you need to use that information and show that information in your calculations. So, for example, 
if the site said that they weren't going to do more than 90 units a year, say, you can't then put in your schedule that they're going to do more than that because there's no evidence to support it. So it very much has to be based on our evidence and also our own sort of knowledge in terms of how these sites come forward. Officers within the council do that initially, and then that is all verified by Hampshire County Council, who verify these figures across the board for Hampshire and come back and challenge officers about assumptions that are made. So there are a number of checks almost that you go through in terms of doing that process with Hampshire County Council. And then, as I said, the ultimate test really is through appeal. And what has happened is that some of the sites that Honorly um, Cubit was mentioning through that process, they have actually been moved outside the five-year supply in response to what inspectors have said about deliverability of those sites. So you need to take all that into account. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Andy. Um, Laura, are you ready for your question now? It just in relation, can I just pick up on that though with Joe? So mm -hmm. in relation to, we're required to do a ha have a, a, a review of the local plan because we don't have a five-year housing land supply. Is it not a self-fulfilling prophecy that if a developer then withholds uh, development or, or slows down development, it then ensures that we, we're having to then have a review and then we have to identify more sites. Is there nothing, I mean, if we haven't had a five-year housing line of supply for the last three years, what could we have done differently or what should we do to bring these sites forward or those ones that you're talking about within the planning process that we look at the phasing to ensure that that didn't happen? Is there things that we could do differently and is it not, are we not, in relation to the five year, it's, it's an inevitable that we will end up having to redo the review because developers are holding back on site development. Yeah, I, mean, I can very much understand the point, but that's how land supply works. That you know, the government guidance is very strict on that, that you, you have to work with the development industry. Um, I mean, there have obviously been things that have said about how the develop, how developers come back on that and how they supply information and to what extent they land bank, et cetera. But we have to work with that process uh, and that's as much as we can do. We can work proactively with developers and encourage them to come forward as quickly as possible, which we do. Um, you can try and do things through conditions, et cetera, which again, which we do. And we take a very proactive approach. But ultimately, I mean, developers only really comment on their own sites anyway. So you need to have a large enough number of sites and different sites to make sure that overall we are we are delivering what we need to deliver. So in terms of what we can do is sort of continuing that proactive approach as much as we can, updating the local plan to look at new sites and new opportunities to boost the supply. But we do have to work within that general Sort of set of rules really in terms of involving developers in that process. No, can I, is there, do we have someone in the council who's responsible for chasing that and, you know, and to encouraging developers to, you know, do we have a, a person that takes on that role to actively encourage development earlier? I don't know whether Ruth wants to come in on that, but I mean, from our perspective, we do that anyway through the policy work and the work that we do through the monitoring. We are always having those conversations as a planning policy team with developers to see how they can bring sites forward. And it's approach taken throughout de development management as well with officers. There's not a specific officer, as far as I'm aware, who does that, but it's done on a site by site basis as applications come in, working proactively to make sure we can get things through the process as quickly as possible. Okay, thank you, Joe. Uh, if I can move on to Councillor Dillo, please. Hi, um, I can, can you just clarify the green and the red? Because obviously at the top, it's at 850 with the targets, and we actually built 1,259. Obviously, we're pushing back on the big number, hopefully. Um, so if we built too many, why is that green? Because that too many is bad, isn't it? The green is basically because if, if you meet your target, so if you meet 850, then you've, yeah. you've passed or met that target. If it's over and above that, you've still met it. So it's still green. But obviously we're looking to reduce, hopefully, the number of houses we build a year. And we've built considerably more than what we wanted to. We are in terms of the future. 
but from the past we've actually had a shortfall in our supply right. in the past so the process has changed within this year because we've now moved to the standard method but right. before that it was very much you had to do a certain number of units over the whole plan period so because we had a shortfall we were actually encouraging more at that point and, and trying to kind of catch up almost and this is what we've had over the last three years we've very much had a catch up because we had three or four years with very low levels of completions so that's why so it's an annual target so as long as we're meeting that annual target then that's but, but historically we've we, the town has grown enormously hasn't it yes but again in line with the targets that we've had so overall if you look at over the plan period to date we haven't met that 850 figure over the plan period yet. We still have a shortfall of, of nearly about a thousand units. So if you were still working in that system as such, we would still be wanting to catch up. But as I said, it's all changed now because the plan's five years old, so we've gone to the standard method. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Watts. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I, was, I was gonna come back on the leads an initial statement, but I thought I'll save it for this. Um, the whole crux of this five-year land supply, I mean, the council hasn't dealt very well with many down, is, as Mr. Boyce, Boyce said, is the top-down approach from this central government on the five-year land supply. And it's Onnelly's beloved NPPF is the root cause of this borough's problems. Um, so we, the, the officers have done an excellent job of trying to understand this five-year land supply and it's been tried and tested uh, by the inspector. I think I read somewhere it's like a Liverpool method that we've adopted and it's been endorsed by the uh, by the inspector. So I wouldn't lay the blame at the administration or officers for the five-year land supply. Mine would be of this absurd centralised bureaucratic government uh, is, is the root cause of this five-year land supply. But my, my question is, is when are we actually going to meet this five-year land supply? Joe, is that one for you? Yeah, I mean, that's a very difficult question to answer because obviously we update all of the figures every year. So at this point, it's difficult to say when we will get that position back. It seems unlikely that we'll do that in the short term, which is why we're reviewing the plan and looking at additional sites which we might potentially need, because there's a real fall off sort of 2024 to 26. And it's really you need new sites to come in and fill that gap. It's more complicated than that, because obviously the sites within the pipeline and you want to do as much as you can to bring those forward as well as looking for new sites. So it's very difficult and it is potentially going to be quite close for a number of years. That the one thing I did want to just mention in light of Councillor Cubitt's comments about many down, now that we've got outline permission for many down and whether that changes the situation, many down is already included in the five year supply. So it was already assumed that we would get outline on that. And it's over 500 units from many down within the five year supply period. So that granting of outline is not going to change the overall position. Thank you, Joe. Councillor Mahaffey. Thanks, Joe. Just an add on to Gary's question there about when the five year land supply will come back in. When we fell short originally, which was in, I can't remember, was it 2019? Um, we were initially told that not to worry too much because um, it's very likely that the five year land supply will be back in place by Christmas. So I think we were looking at a four, five, six month deficit, was, was my memory of it. Um, what's happened to change that view? There's a whole raft of reasons. And that's to say, so land supply is influenced by so many different things. So there's, there's numerous factors why we're in the position we're in and why it continues to be the case. So we have got the case that where we expected some sites to come forward and they haven't, and that's continued to be the case. So they haven't come forward at the pace that we expected in the local plan or since. So that has obviously impacted on things. Also, because we have had such high completions, that basically takes things away from the supply. So we've had to have higher completions in the last couple of years than we would have expected. So that impacts on it. There's other sites that have come forward more slowly. So some developers where they would have said to us previously, we're going to develop, say, 150 on a site. They're now saying they're going to develop 90 on a site. And as I said, we need to take all of that into account. So there's a whole raft of reasons why that it's influ how it's influenced which is why i said i can't really say categorically when we get the five years supply back 
because there's no have, have we got underlying data to back up like you were saying that you know we suddenly had lots of completions that we weren't expecting what's the what's the underlying data that's caused that have we looked into that why is that why, why did that catch us on the words it can be because developers are bringing things forward more quickly for example or issues get resolved there's a whole raft of reasons on a site-by-site basis that developers might choose to do something different and things can be put together i said there's almost like a pent-up demand there was initially and now sites are going forward really quite quickly we've had a number of sites with really high completion levels on them and that's what the developers has chosen to do overall really there's a hole there because we need more sites with permission coming forward so until that sort of happens and we have a steady supply we're always going to be in this position where it's going to be quite close. So what I'm hearing is we don't have enough underlying data to be able to make a, any kind of forecast at all, really. No, we, we, have, we have extensive data um, we, of, for all sorts. And it's, we do a very detailed land supply um, system of monitoring, perhaps more than some authorities, really a robust approach. It's more the fact that's the nature of land supply. Nature of land supply will change every year. It's just the, the way it is. And so you can make a judgment and the judgment would be that we're going to continue to be quite close around just below or just around the five year mark. But that may change. I said by a few hundred units here or a few hundred units there. We're not going to be, sorry, I was just going to say we're not going to be in a robust position. So if you're looking at a robust position where really you'd have six years of supply, we're not going to be in that robust position until we have a new local plan in place. Okay. Can we, can we leave it there? Yeah, fantastic. Can, Thank can, you. Okay. Sorry, can I just ask in relation to the short? I guess it comes back to the next one on the on the list. But in relation to yeah, the short, just just before we do that, look, I, 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 this is a good point because we have, we have sort of strayed into the next point. Can I just yeah. be, before you ask your question? Can I ask? Is there anybody else who has any comments specifically on housing delivery, number of homes built? So that first line of the table, or anything from pages fifty two through to pages fifty six. If there's not, and it doesn't look like there is, then we can move on to, or can officially move on to um, housing land supply, which is the second line of the table, and also pages 56 through to 69. So quite a long section there. So I'll give you a bit of time to flick through it. But yeah, Laura, you can, you're welcome to go first on that question. All right, so I was... So in actual figures, Joe, how much, how many units are we short in relation to the housing land supply? And against the table in Appendix 3, is, is there any possibility, I know it says before, is there any possibility in bringing any of that forward? Or is it, could we use any of our housing grant money to encourage a developer in relation to that, could we have substantial housing grant in, in our budgets that could help encourage the developer to bring something forward that they maybe weren't able to do before? And if we did do that, what difference would that make in relation to the local plan and their policies? The, there's a table on large page 59, which shows the position. And that shows that we're 483 units short of having a five-year supply. So that, that gives you an idea of that. As I said, in reality, you really need a robust supply of sort of six years, really. So that would be really more nearly one and a half thousand dwellings to be in a very robust position. But rather than robust, we only need a five-year, don't we? We literally need to the figure, don't we? You do, for the purposes of the AMR, absolutely right. But when it comes to appeals, so you, you will go through it site by site and the inspector will always look to have a, a, buff, a buffer as such. And through that process, they will always look to reduce your numbers. Or Isn't the buffer down. built into that table, a 5% buffer there, 219? No, because you have to do that anyway. That's kind of included in your baseline of figures. It's, it's more to, to show that you've got some flexibility there in case some sites don't come forward or, or come forward slightly differently. So yeah, that, that's a bit different. So that, that's the figure, but that shows you what you would need to do. I mean, in terms of looking at the sites, for example, that Councillor Cubit was talking about, 
two of those sites and the sites that make up the, the, the biggest proportion, almost three quarters of, of what she was saying. So that sites with permission that kind of come forward slowly or not as quickly as we'd like was Hampson Fields and Basingstoke Golf Course. So they're included for phasing of about 100 units a year or so. But because they obviously sites come forward at a certain rate. So one of those sites, for example, is over 700 units fall outside the five year supply. Now, you could encourage the developer as much as possible to bring that forward. But if you were doing so and you to put all of that in the five year supply, you'd be looking at rates of way over 200 units a year rather than 90, say, or 100. And developers probably aren't going to do that. So as much as we can talk to them and we will and we do encourage them to come forward as quickly as possible. This is based on the phasing that they've got. We have gone through a process before um, where we've looked at all of the sites where there is potential to encourage them through unlocking funding or getting rid of barriers et cetera, to bring sites forward. And we do go through that process and we have done that to see whether we can support it. And this is really probably as positive a position as we can get to from going through that process. Thank you, Joe. Um, Councillor McCormick. Thank you, Chair. Um, table 5.5 on page 61, you've got the golf course there with a thousand gross dwellings, which I assume is the figure that you're using in the local plan. Um, but we have heard that they're only gonna be building about 250 because Thames Water says there's insufficient sewerage capacity. How does that impact the local plan and the housing supply figures? I mean, the local, plan is, the local plan is slightly different. So just in terms of phasing, those sort of things are taken into account in the phasing and what we include in the five-year supply. So that's exactly the sort of information that we have to have to take account of. So all of the thousand dwellings for that are in the pipeline. They're just phased in a way that it will reflect what can actually come forward. So for that, I can't remember off the top of my head what it was. It's 90 or 100 a year, I think, over that sort of each year over the five-year period, which takes that into account. Thank you. Councillor Mahaffey. Thanks, Chair. I've said this before, and I know this isn't within the gift of, of officers or the council, but this is really for uh, Councillor Bounds' benefit, um, is that surely we should be lobbying government to um, require developers to make the civil payment at the beginning of the development rather than after the houses have all been built uh, and, uh, and filled, because surely that would be the only way that we could economically put the screws on them to uh, to bring sites forward. Um, I'm hoping that is part of our lobbying to government. Mm -hmm. So, Bowen, do you want to? Uh, oh, I, I, I would I would agree with Councillor Mahaffey. I, I think uh, it, without without ducking it a bit. Obviously, I've not had the portfolio for long, and actually, one of my pieces of work has been absolutely about five-year land supply, housing numbers, and of course also infrastructure as well. So actually where, when, and why we get money out of developers becomes paramount. Okay, thank you. I think uh, Ruth, did you have your hand up as well? Yes, I was just going to explain that we do actually under the current system um, receive the payment of SIL um, at the point of commencement, depending on the phasing of a site. Um, what the issue is, is that we have a couple of um, large sites which um, are coming forward, which um, are nil seal, but they might be seal liable, but they have a nil seal rating. Um, the consultation that central government did in relation to the planning reforms were to shift the seal payment to the completion point um, so that development would be able to have the benefit of being able to cash flow their schemes rather than having the, um, you know, the, the burden of a payment of infrastructure payment at the point of commencement. So in fact, um, the, the, the direction that central government is, uh, were taking as part of that consultation is actually the opposite to what you're asking for, Councillor McCormick, and the current system is the one that we, which you were saying you thought would be good, is the one we've already got. The only reason why we don't really have an awful lot of SIL, which is more for the next item, is that we haven't been a char SIL charging authority for very long. Yeah, it's Councillor Mahaffey, not Councillor McCormick, but don't worry. Um, everyone's getting my name wrong recently. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I mean, I, I do realise that, but yeah, I would argue for it to 
to you know, you, you say the burden is going to be on the developers. The burden is there's always going to be a burden, and at the moment the burden is on our residents, our rivers, our infrastructure, and us as a council. Um, you know, I would argue that uh, the sill needs to be payment as soon as is possible after planning is granted. Otherwise, you know, what's the imperative for developers to actually get their act together before they come to uh, planning? They just make speculative planning applications as they are at the moment. And then uh, we're in this situation that we're in. OK, thanks for your time. Thank you, Simon. OK, any other questions on housing land supplies? So that second row on the table or pages, big pages, 56 to 69. Yes, Councillor Vaux. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, an observation, as much as uh, a question, that um, just looking through the, the um, land supply and, and in what was uh, in, in our what well, is in our current local plan and what's been delivered, what hasn't, and, and the impact that's had on the housing supply, I would just like to also emphasise the issue that it has on phasing when these developments don't come through in the phasing that they're expected when the local plan is written also has huge impact on infrastructure and local communities so you know the case in point which i've talked about before is you know easter basingstoke was meant to have been started in 2017 or something hasn't other developments that are adjacent to it that were reliant on the community amenities that were going to be created in easter basingstoke are now being built. So they they don't have those community facilities. So I appreciate how difficult it is to keep developers to the timing that they say they're going to have, but it does have huge knock-on effects on communities when um, these things don't work out as they should. So thank you. Thank you, no, good point, good point. Um, okay, let's move on in that case to the next row, which is percentage of homes built on previously developed lands. So that's line three of the table and also pages 69 to 70 of the main report. Any questions there? Councillor James. Mine was just uh, picking up on the grey boxes, I suppose, in relation mm -hmm. to the RAG ratings. So this is saying that we have a 38% gross new homes were built on previously developed land. And what the, the, the target is, is to make effective use of the land. Why is that grey? We Shouldn't that be, has it met it or has it not met it? Is that amber or... I'm concerned about the grey ratings and, and not being able to measure. Um, either they're not, the targets need to be smarter, but I think that that, that one is actually clear what it's saying. And um, we've, when we have done a lot of development that is on greenfield, haven't we? Some of it is converted, but um, would we want that in grey? I don't think that's an indicator. If we're truly wanting to look at this against last year, how are we going to measure our success and really challenge ourselves as a, with a document? Okay, thanks, Laura. Joe, do you want to come back to that one? Yeah, I mean, these targets are taken directly out of the local plan, and there is an issue about smart targets, because some of the targets are not, basically, so they're not numeric, and therefore it's difficult to really say what would be red or what would be green. It's a conversation we had at committee about the AMR a couple of years ago, where officers had sort of taken a judgment almost on, on what that colour should be, and the committee at that time raised real concerns, saying they were too subjective, and therefore, unless there was an actual numerical sort of target as such, then they should be greyed out because it wasn't for officers to make that decision. So that's what we've got here. Any that aren't like that, they're, they're now grey. Yeah, so, uh, I think I just, yeah it, it, it is difficult, isn't it, to, to, to put a colour against it when there is a numerical target. So I guess that's probably something for, for the portfolio holder to note when, um, when the local plan update gets to, to, to that particular point. But if, you, if you look at the comparison, so what we're saying is that in a comparison in, 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 on that box, it's decreased proportion of homes built from previously was 47, mm. now 38. Uh, you know, there is a clear measure. We've got a measure that we're saying, you know, that we've, and I just think, I think we need to say whether we've achieved that or not. I just, or again, I guess in relation to the new local plan, we need to be able to make measure and it's essential that we're able to measure these things going forward. Um, but I just like to ra raise my concern about the grey boxes. 
Yeah, that's that's noted. I, I share your concern. I, I just think for for this case, I, I I can't see how else we can do that. But I think it's definitely a, a point to to note for for the local plan update is to to make sure that our objectives are smart there. Okay, anything else on homes built on previously developed land? No, in which case we'll move on to windfall sites. That's the fourth line of the table and pages 71 through to 75, 74. A couple of questions there. Um, Gary, Gary Watts. It's just a quite straightforward one. Yeah. Why have we got a, a target on something we can't control? We have a target there for windfall to yeah. basically to make sure it, that, yeah. yes. sorry to make to make sure that we can count them in our figures. Yes. So um, we've we've got an allowance for well, you'd include them anyway in terms of when they come forward. We can include them in terms of our completions, but it's more for the local plan making because we include a, a small windfall allowance of fifty units a year, which totals obviously a certain total over those 50, 15 years. That means that we don't then need to find those numbers on another allocation. So it reduces the number of allocations we need. Yeah, yeah I, I understand that, but I just don't see it as a target. I mean, windfall sites are going to come along and we can't control them. So why have it as a target? Why is it? I just don't see it myself, you know. We can't it's, control it's it. for those reasons, really. And it's also to sort of help with the monitoring moving forward. So, for example, if we, if we get more than that target of 50, we could theoretically through the next local plan increase that target which would then reduce allocations even more so it's that whole process really because you need to show trends for that the government guidance is quite clear that for windfall you need to show trend-based information and how that relates to any target that you've set so well, I, I thought it would come back to this government setting silly targets so thank you joanne for that thank you, <laughs> thank you gary uh council laura james so following on from that it if, if your argument is that you're doing it because you want to allocate, you want the numbers to be counted, if you look at the, I mean, it, we've, we've, the number of uh, windfall is enormous against what was planned. It's almost as many, if you look at permitted development on the table on page 55. But if we take out permitted developments, it's still enormous. In that case, Joe against uh, what was being raised about the number of units well, if we're only required to build 850 and we're building 1,559 at six should we increase the, the number of windfall if we we want them to be accounted for or how can we if we're not wanting to do that how can we get away from this enormous number of speculative development that's not planned you know it's as many as is planned it, what is going wrong i mean a lot of windfall development is not necessarily negative i mean just because it's windfall it means that it's not actually allocated in the plan but it can still be and mostly is in line with policies so for example you've got sites within built-up areas or on brownfield land where they're not specific allocations we would still want them to come forward so that that's why you have your policy framework so it's it's not a straightforward windfall a negative necessarily. You might not have you might not have so say you'd let Chapel Hill come forward, you know, as a windfall, you then may not have had another site that came forward as a greenfield development within the local plan because that was there. So if you could count Chapel Gate as a a windfall and it was an increased windfall, wouldn't it enable you then to have less of the other sites that we're having to identify that are, are causing so many problems? Yes, absolutely. But that, that was an approach that we took through the last local plan. This is something we can obviously revisit now through the next plan of what is a suitable approach. But the argument was at that point, because you have to show sort of flexibility, so the inspector looks for flexibility in your figures, because we weren't oversupplying, some, some authorities do it, for example, they use reserve sites and things like that. And this council was quite keen not to have reserve sites or not to over allocate. So to give us that flexibility, we, had, we didn't have a specific large site windfall that we had to rely on. That was our flex, basically. And, and that's, that's the approach we took. So we can review that moving forward. 
What do you think okay. it should be then? You know, in the new local plan, what would you, you know, what, you know, what do you think in, in light of what we've been delivering over the last three years or so, what do you think it should be? We have to show flex. So we're going to have to do that somehow, whether that's by windfall or you can add a percentage, for example, or you can have reserve sites. There will have to be a way of doing that. So through the local plan process, we can look at it. But um, as you say, there are notable numbers that are coming forward through windfall. Having said that, we still don't have a five-year supply and that windfall that we had as our sort of buffer almost has had to come into play and we still haven't had enough. So we have to balance all of those issues moving forward to see what the best approach would be. Okay, thank you. We'll leave that one there and move on to the next line, which is regeneration. And that also ties in with pages 75 and 76 of the, the main report. Um, I've, I've got a question on this one, and that is given our target, given we did actually have a numer numerical target for this one of, of 200 net initial dwellings, and we've said no units were completed, why isn't that one in red? So it would seem like an obvious one to, to have highlighted in red, unless I'm missing something. I can't specifically remember the reason why the committee wanted that grey in the past, but it was one that was picked up for that. Okay, yes, I, I think Ruth, Ruth's put her hand up. I think she, she might have, have an answer here if, if I'm able to, to interrupt, Joe. Sorry. Yeah. Ruth? It's because you measure it in 2029 and you still might achieve this and you still might achieve it over the life of the local plan. So effectively, we're keeping it as grey because actually, um, you know, the 200 units would um, may well actually come forward by 2029. So it's not an annual target of It's not years. an annual target. It's a local plan target. Okay, that's that's understandable. Okay, there's a couple, couple of additional hands up. Um, Councillor Dillow? I suppose it, um, you're, the expectation is that Winklebury will be built quite quickly, basically. Uh, it's particularly, obviously, the houses on the Fort Hill site, which are going to be modular, aren't they? Which are, should only take about 18 months to build. Thank you, Councillor Dillow. Councillor Laura James. I wanted to pick up in relation to page 75. It talks about Chapel Gate being, um, it's on uh, 537, being a regeneration. Now, I don't really class that, and I'm very involved in that with Paul in relation to the development of that, but that's not a regeneration in the sense of a regeneration. I, 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 that's, a, you know, it's really a, it was a brownfield development and it's a straight housing development in a sense. So I'm surprised that we're calling that a regeneration. But I also wanted to pick up in relation to SS2, then the looking, and I haven't looked at then I haven't got the hard copy of the new policy that you're proposing, but in relation to the policies that you were proposing that we saw, it was very weakened and it didn't, and it didn't talk about housing development. It talked more about sort of the fabric of the estates and things and then move away from regeneration as we know it so I don't know it's quite disingenuous this report as against where the new policy is going um, and in a sense you know it, it, um, it talked about that we talked in the outcome and the key findings is about Winkerbury, Buxton, Southam and Norden um, when well, no work has been done I know that you're saying that we're focusing on Winkleberry of the 200 units, but I think everyone was very disappointed with the regeneration report that came forward. And I just think there's such more opportunities and such a disappointment in relation to uh, regeneration going forward. Okay, um, Ruth, you got your hand up there? Yep, so um, just as you've been considering draft policies, there'll also be a different monitoring framework for the new local plan and I think the point you're making is something for the future rather than the currently adopted local plan but um yeah I hear your point. Thank you. Um, Councillor Diller you've still got your hand up is that is that a legacy hand or is do you have another question? No that's gone thank you very much. Okay let's move on then to density of residential development which is at the next line of the table and also page 76 and top of page 77 of the report. Any questions on that? No, and in which case we'll move on to new homes permitted in the countryside. 
which is section 5.2, so that's page 77 through to page 80. Councillor Carruthers. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, just, just as regards to the last paragraph um, in the box um, that says of the 22 relevant appeals, nine of these were allowed by the planning inspectorate. Just think that's quite concerning considering we're talking about countryside development and exceptional circumstances. So just, just really, you know, want to understand what do we need to do as a borough to, prevent, to protect our countryside and, and prevent planning by appeal, particularly in areas like this. Um, and also, um, I think there's a typo here in the box at the end. 150 net new dwellings were consented in the countryside in 2019, 2020. 226 net new dwellings were completed in the countryside in 2019, 2020. So I assume that's just a typo. Okay, so um, Joe, you, 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 you want to you go first? Um, I was just going to say, is that 150? That's consented. Were the 226 the ones which were actually completed? So that's that's sort of the difference in terms of the appeal decisions. Yes, I mean I can completely see the point. And it when we're looking at reviewing the policies, that's the process that we go through to exactly to see what issues are coming up at appeals to see whether we need to strengthen any criteria, for example, if there are common issues. So that is something that we monitor and look at. Thank you very much, Councillor Mahaffey. On that one, Joe, um, you look at the appeals. I've got a particular issue with a couple of um, houses that have come up in my ward in the countryside, which I, to be honest, I think the Development Control Committee have just uh, gone a bit bonkers. Um, so my question is that information that you glean from the planning inspector's decisions, how can you feed that back into DC or to councillors in general? Um, because um, I, I don't see evidence of, 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 of DC making decisions based on planning inspectors' uh, uh, conclusions. I don't know if there's thoughts come in there, but as, as far as I'm aware, when those appeal decisions they come through, they are circulated um, to relevant members, so they are made aware of those decisions. I appreciate they're circulated, but you said you analysed them um, and yeah. analysed this. Uh, and, and again, going back to my sort of underlying data and trends, would make life an awful lot easier because you know we all receive an awful lot of documentation and uh, inspectors reports are fairly lengthy very often so if some sort of information or some sort of you know sort of trends can be fed back that might be useful thank you Ruth did you want to come in there um thank you chair um I'll just um give councillor Heffy my, my my view on that um we can do that I know you get the emails with all of the appeals and whenever there's actually an appeal decision that's relevant to an application, you'll find the case officers include it within the actual um, relevant planning history. Um, and I think there's some validity around what you're saying because it would probably be useful for DC committee to see um, some of the um, history of all of the decisions um, and what's been coming out in terms of um, the outcomes of those decisions. Um, and we could probably look to do that more as an evening session. So I can happily pick that up with you around what we can cover on that evening. But um, yeah, it might be quite um, a worthwhile process. That would be appreciated. Thank you. Thanks, Ruth. Thanks for the question, Simon. Councillor McCormick, you had your hand up. It seems to have gone down now. Yeah, I've, uh, I think my question's been answered. Oh, Lovely. Uh, but hang on a minute. Just, just a point uh -huh. on the, the development control. Actually, it is a material thing that we look at uh, planning inspectors decisions we, we we had a decision last night uh we were informed about north waltham uh where we previously made a decision we'd refused an application it'd been overturned on appeal a near identical uh application came back and we had to approve it because it had previously been overturned on appeal and it would it, it cost the council money, we had costs awarded against us, and it would have been unreasonable of us to have expected a different appeal outcome for a near identical application. So if that's bonkers, um, I would like to know what he's saying. The, the, to me, the opposite of that would be bonkers. Well, let's, let's, let's leave that one there. I think that's a discussion for another time, but um, it's uh, uh, 
it's a fair point. I think I, I, I can see the arguments on both sides there, but we need to keep cracking on with our agenda this evening. So our next section, uh, next line of the table is new homes near nuclear installations, which also relates to pages 80 and 81 of the reports. Councillor Laura James. It was just relation to the 16 gross dwellings were built within the offsite emergency planning area. We've got within the, uh, the new numbers, 90 that are going to be allocated. How on earth are we going to, to deliver that? Um, and, and, and I just want to talk about just the reality of what is being built against what is, is in the numbers. Joe. Sorry, Councillor James, when you talk about numbers, is this in relation to the report of last week where we talk about future numbers yes. for Tadley? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's something that we talked about um, at that committee saying that number is probably not achievable um, just because, because of this constraint, but that we would look to, to put some development at Tadley if we can that will be outside of the area that's affected. So that's something that we, we need to go through that process. But we did. So, yeah. yeah, so if... if, if so if at the moment they've only delivered 16 gross, if that is the sort of number you're talking about, what happens to the remaining in the figure in that 90, you know, where does that go? Are you, are you going to have to share that out amongst other villages or what, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, there's a question that I answered last week, that if, if that figure didn't come forward at Tadley, what would happen to it? And basically that figure would go back into the overall total. So we'd have to find it elsewhere. It wouldn't be somewhere specific, but it would basically come, come back into the overall global figure. Is that overall as in the whole area or is that the rural area? In the borough, generally. It's a whole, yeah, we, yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, thank you very much. Councillor Carruthers. Thank you, Chair. Um, just to reiterate what I said last week, really, and that is that, you know, we've got this figure of zero for Tadley. Um, and although I certainly don't want to see the high numbers um, that that were um, the box sticking tells us that, that we should have, um, you know, we can see here that 40 houses were approved. I know where those houses are and, and I can tell you that some of them are really not that far from AWE. Um, so I do think that perhaps we do need to um, push back a little bit on this and perhaps um, when, we're, when we are looking at housing, I do think that we do need to put some houses in Tadley um, and we, we need to challenge this a little bit. Yeah, thanks, Karen. I, I think we, we agree that, that, that we would definitely do that. So, yeah, I think, I think that's, a, that's a very fair point. Um, Councillor Watts. No, I just echo that. We, we need to push back. I mean, it's 945 allocated for Tadley. Uh, they're probably going to get about 50. Uh, it was reported in, in the first map we had that those were going to come back to Basingstoke, Basingstoke Town itself. So we'll have to find another 900 odd homes in Basingstoke. And we're already getting 16,000. So, um, you know, we need to push back. And as Councillor Crevers said last week, they have local need housing need in Tadley and they need some housing there. So, yeah, I, mean, I, I think that one, that one is already being covered off, Gary. So just, yeah. just in the in, in interest of, of sort of keeping to All time, right, if, if I can leave you there. But yeah, that has yeah. been noted. And uh, yeah. it's, uh, it's a point I think that, that all of us agree with um, last week and, and continue to do so. So if we can move on then next to housing mix, that's the next line in the table. It's also on pages 82 through to 84 of the report. Any questions or comments on that? I'd just like to uh, point out, and we can look at it when we look at the affordable, but if you look at the outcomes of the key findings in relation to the percentages, so if you look at the percentage of um, flat flats against houses this is table 5.15 are you you're referring to yeah is on page 82 yeah yes no at 5.3 it's the targets relevant policies and the outcomes of the key findings so it's not a table it's just it's talking about the key findings what i'm saying is 
and we can look at the affordable housing, but if we look at the percentage of what's been delivered against, and it is on that table as well, 5.41 as well. If you look at the percentage of, on the number of one bedroom flats, as opposed to three bedroom houses, there's a, um, a lot more in relation to um, the market rather than affordable of, um, bedrooms being built in houses rather than flats and we, I can talk about that when I get onto it but it, it's just to point you out to that figure now so yeah. you're aware of it. No thank you for that yes we'll, we'll come on to that in just a second Councillor Dillow. Yeah what I was a little bit concerned of is the number of um, flats delivered through um, permitted development that were that fell below the size threshold. Yes, well, can we so come on to that? Because really there's a separate point a bit further on, about, specifically about that, <laughs> Councillor Dillow. Um, yeah. So if, if, if you can save your question and your comment for that, that'd be <laughs> helpful. Thank you. Yep, no um, any other questions on, on market housing mix and type? No, okay. In that case, I propose we move on to, we can do the next two rows of the table together. So affordable housing delivery, and affordable housing consents. So that takes us from page 85 through to page 86, sorry, um, so I'm getting confused. Yeah, page 85 through to page 89. Any comments? Sorry, page 85, sorry, through to 87. Apologies. Um, Councillor Dillo, or is that a legacy hand? I think you might be muted if you are trying to speak. I can't quite see you on my screen, Councillor, did I? Here we go. Um, ah, there you go. Yeah, on, on page 85, the completions, yeah. it says that 38% of the net new homes delivered during the year, um, they didn't, uh, were not required, uh, whereas it says it felt below the size threshold. So that basically means, you know, they were packing them in and we just didn't have any opportunity to question that because it was permitted, wasn't it? Yeah, that, that was my worry. And I thought, surely there must be a way around that because they're just building um, sort of flats, small flats that aren't really fit for purpose, in my opinion. I completely agree that there is there's a section a little bit later on, which, which actually names some of these properties that, that have fallen short. So if, if we can tackle this then, Councillor Dillo, um, I'll, I'll make sure you, you get an opportunity to speak there because I also have, have some quite strong points to make on that. So we'll I, I won't forget that, I promise. Um, Councillor Watts. Um, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, when I came up a couple of years ago, um, they were substandard. Um, so, yeah, I think the committee vented its uh, frustration. Uh, what my question was um, around the um, handsome fields. We've got 750 dwellings going there and we have... 61 affordable homes in my calculation that's less than 10 percent and it says in the report is it was done on the reserve planning could you explain why we've got such a low affordability figure in uh, handsome fields i'm not sure exactly where you're referring to but the fact that it's low it would reflect the completions within this year if you're talking about completions so there will be other affordable housing units that come forward, obviously, Probably. later on in the development. This is just what's happened within the, the initial phases and the initial developments coming forward. Yeah, but in the next um, um, you talk on the, was it 5.18, you, you quote the golf club, you know, you're going to get 400 affordable homes there. But there's nothing about handsome fields and handsome fields has been built now. I mean, because you turn, well, not you personally, but the whole area is a complete mess because we're developing handsome fields. And we just reported that we've got 71, <coughs> 61 affordable homes. I just want, want to know what we've got over the whole period, please. That table there, the way you've got that 5.18, 
that just refers to new consents within the monitoring year. So Hampson Fields isn't included in that because it wasn't given permission over that 12 months period. It already had permission. Right. So I, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. I think Councillor Watts is referring to paragraph 5.68, uh, which at the end talks about furthermore, two reserve matters applications were approved, which included 60 dwellings at Redlands and 61 dwellings yeah. at Hampson Fields. But it goes back to the point that it, it's not for the whole development. That's a reserve matter. So it's only for a particular phase. It's not for the whole 750. Right. Okay. So it is, it is forty percent there, is it? There, at Hanson Fields. I couldn't confirm that because I don't know how. Ruth, Ruth's got a hand up. So she might be able to answer that one for us. I won't give you the figure tonight, um, Councillor Watts, but we will email you what yeah. the percentage is and what will be delivered on Hanson Fields um, subsequent to the meeting. That's fine. Thank, Thank you, Ruth. Could you send it to Vaux? Sorry, Laura. We'll come back to you in just a second. I promise, Councillor Vaux, first, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, on um, para 566 on page 86, big page 86, um, yes. it talks about the forms of tenure, 55% were rented and 45% were shared ownership. And I appreciate the policy doesn't differentiate between affordable and social rents, but I would really like to know what we were providing in, in the ways of social rented um, uh, not just affordable, uh, if there was any. And I mean, I am looking going forward that we will be able to be more specific about social rents um, in our policy. But I just wondered, if not at this meeting, if you could um, tell us what that is. And, you know, in the future, it would be really nice if we could have that in the report, even though it's not a requirement, it would just be really good. Yeah, yeah we, can, we, can, we can come back and provide that to you as well at the same time. Thank you. Cool. And, and can we make the note as well that, that in, in the future we, we see if we can split that up? Because I, I, I agree that that would be would be quite useful. And Councillor Laura James, over to you. No, thank you. It was, I was just saying in relation to what Gary asked for, it'd be good if we could, I think I've asked for it before in relation to, I think I picked up on this issue before. So it would be good that we all had the information on the phasing of that site, the housing fields. Um, can I, in relation to the um, table 5.17, it does that include shared ownership? Is that as affordable units? Are we talking about within that shared ownership as well? Ruth, I think you're, you're first. I was about uh, to say, um, I, I'm pretty sure it's all affordable tenures, unless Joe corrects me. So, yeah. Yeah, I think it is. Is, is, it, is it possible in the future, and it's a bit like what's been asked before, but I really think that the shared ownership should be a separate box to social or affordable rent. I think it's important that we have a separate, so we understand how we, because I'm sure... That if you was to look at the number of flats that are building being built not for shared ownership but for just for those on the register it would be a very different picture and i think it's really important we ha understand that <coughs> and the other one is i wanted to just pick up here and i say it all the time but i just want to flag it again we we built <coughs> last year 136 two-bedroom flats so in relation to our allocation policy, <clears throat> they will be housing predominantly families because that, that's what they're entitled to. And like I say, once they're housed into a flat, it's very difficult for people to move on out of that. And I understand that in talking to Carolyn Wardridge, that a paper went to scrutiny uh, where Kate was saying it's very difficult at the moment to allocate two bedroom flats because people now realise if they take that, they're not going to. So how do we look at this issue against the number of, and if I showed you the, the table beforehand, we're building a lot more flats in this area. And if we actually looked at it again in, in drilled down, I'm sure it's for people, if we looked to talk away the shared ownership from this, we would find that the figure would be even greater in relation to affordability and who was being housed in flats and what we're building. And we're building very few um, three bedroom houses there, aren't we? 96. 
And again, I'd like to know, that maybe you could tell me what percentage of those are, sh maybe I could ask the question that you send me that information, what, what in this table, how it differs between shared ownership and affordable. Yeah, I mean, we can look into that. We can look into it and see how much we can break that down for you. Okay. Thank you. That's great. Councillor Dillo, is that a legacy hand or is that a... No, a, I was just going to um, follow on. Go for it. I was just going to say, follow on from Councillor James, obviously the low number of three beds, because that doesn't really allow families to um, remain in, in, the, in their community when, you know, if they have more than one child, then they're stuck, especially if they're obviously they're opposite sex. If they get older, they're going to need separate bedrooms. And I just, it just worries me that the large number of two beds as opposed to threes, um, obviously they're, you know, it's more expensive, but, you know, if we built more three bed affordable houses, it would give, um, you know, families the opportunity to stay in one place and build, build communities. Absolutely. Thank you. Noted. Um, okay, let's move on then to houses for older people and people with support needs. That's the next line of the table. It's also pages 88 and 89. Any comments there? Yeah, I, I do, sorry. Oh, go um, ahead, Councillor. Yeah, Laura James. It, it, just in relation to the one that was I think there's only one planning application that was over 200 units should that should have delivered um, the specialist housing development. It, it was on the golf course. Where is the nearest? Because it talks about a development for specialist housing is nearby. How did they get their guess out of jail? I just was wondering how near it was. I wouldn't be able to answer that off the top of my head. We have to look back at the application and what was considered as that facility. Is it the island site, Joe? Yeah. So yeah. Where, where is, is, is that the one round, round by the, the new pub there? There's, there's yeah, a, I suspect it's, it's the island site. I, mean, I would imagine it is the island site because that is right there and obviously that's currently yeah. under construction. So I would yes, imagine it is. they would really have taken that open into now, yeah. Yeah. I couldn't confirm it, but I would imagine so. Mm -hmm. So, so in relation to that, if, if they then don't have to deliver that, what have they, they've had to deliver accessible and adaptable homes? How do we, in relation to, you know, what's, what do you equate as being acceptable in that? What would we want to see is, what did they deliver? It's just having an understanding of, We've got this growing aging population and that site is quite near to have we considered this and, and should we consider this in future development in relation to old persons yes yeah, so i'll take i'll take that question if you like yeah go um, for it Ruth. so basically um that's all um part of the i suppose the evidence base and the work which the team do in relation to the number of um uh, the, the i suppose the housing standard in relation to um, accommodation um, of this type. In relation to Basingstoke Golf Course, if you like, we can explain in an email after the committee what we mean when we say the accessible and adaptable home standards, because that's, um, that's a set um, standard that they're actually delivering. And in the case of Golf Course, they actually opted to do more houses with the adaptability provisions. So um, that's something that we can explain if if that's unclear that'd be great yeah the policy requires um 15 percent and i think the golf course they did 50 more than they needed to do so that was considered acceptable through the planning application process thank, thank you. you okay let's move on please to self-build and custom house building which is pages 90 to the top of 97 Whilst you're looking through that, obviously this is one of the, the targets that we miss, which is why it's in red. Um, I, I was just going to ask, obviously, when, when we miss targets, there there are often sanctions. So, so with a five-year housing land supply, we've we already discussed what what what, what the um, what the sanctions applied by by central government are and how um, how we suffer as a local authority for missing that target. Is there something similar for when we miss this self-build and, and custom house building target or? Indeed, the next one around, excuse me, gypsy and traveller accommodation. Um, are, are, are we likely to be penalised in any way for missing those targets? 
Well, there are legal duties that, that we do that and we, that we meet those targets. So that there's not a specific penalty as such, like, like a fine, but it's a bit like the five-year land supply in the fact that you obviously have to take that into account in relevant applications. So the fact that we haven't met that legal requirement, that is then a material consideration when we're looking at applications for gypsum traveller pitches and also for self-build units or whether the application was an element of that. So that would then be need considered in as part right. of the round. So it's specific, if we miss a target on a specific issue, it then applies to planning applications for that specific issue. Yeah, exactly. That's a material consideration you need to consider. Thank you. That's very helpful. OK, Councillor McCormick. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm just wondering, there, there's a lot of different figures there about um, joining the self bill register, granting permission, um, plots being secured. How many self-builds actually completed? And what is the trend with self-build? Is it getting easier or harder to self-build? And are we seeing more or less, a uh, greater number of, or, or lesser number um, actually being completed? Joe. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is more about kind of how the number of permissions really equate to our needs. So the need is slowly going up. I wouldn't say significantly. It's about 320 or something like that. I think Robin will probably know better than me. So that, that does continue to trickle up in terms of need. Um, and developers are taking that on board and you are getting some schemes which are including custom build and you are getting some individuals or self-build. But I'm not sure there's, there's a huge growth in it. I think it's a kind of gradual increase would probably be the best way to describe it. Okay, Robin, did you want to come in there? Did, did you have any, any more sort of detailed stats to hand? Yeah, so we have a requirement to um, hold a self-build register, and that's split in two parts. So parts of those who are locally um, locally exclusive, should we say, so um, they live or they're within, um, they either live in the borough or work within the borough, and we need to put those towards our needs. We also have part two, which are people who don't have a local connection to the borough. So in terms of our need and meeting need, it's only those who are part one with a local connection and then they go to the figure that we have. Um, so you'll see um, table 5.25 and that shows our need um, in terms of the part one. So the locally um, registered people. Thank you very much. Okay. There's no other hands up. So we'll move on to Gypsy and Traveller Accommodations. So that's page 97 through to 100. Councillor Mahaffey. Thanks, Chair. Joe, you mentioned at the beginning of the evening that we had eight uh, potential uh, sites have come forward. Those are five in Many Down, two in Hanson Fields, and one in Basingstoke. Um, we all know the need is now, and those are large, long-term sites. Uh, how realistic is it that we're going to see those uh, at any time in the near future? Um, is there any way that we've talked about the phasing of Hampton Fields? Is there any way that we can impel the uh, the developers to bring it into the the early phases? Because inevitably they will want to push it right to the end, uh, because um, traveller sites do not encourage the sale of houses. Um, what pressure can we put on the developers on this one? Andrew may want want to come in on this, but I would just say we are very much encouraging them to do that because really to have a sort of robust supply position a little bit again like the, the, the normal sort of housing as such you need as much certainty about deliverability as possible so you really need reserve matters and as much as you can get on that and we are continuing to encourage developers to do that but Andrew may want to say more as it's a specialist subject. Andrew? <laughs> <laughs> yeah a favourite subject of mine yeah I love talking about this time. Um, yeah, I'd have thought with Hounsom we're in the best position there because obviously we've got an outline and we've also got a full application. Full application, we should definitely be able to count that supply. Golf course, you've got an outline there. We had a reserve matters team I mean, which mentioned gypsy and traveller pitches, but then it wasn't included in the actual phase that was that came in. So it'll probably get shunted to the next phase. So that's probably a little bit further behind. So yeah, those two sites are making good progress. And they, they are our best opportunity to have some supply in the short term, I would say. Manny Down probably a bit further down the line, but that helps. Uh, and it does, but what does short term mean? Because I did notice on page 10 when we were talking, when the 
uh, document that was talking about uh, the traveller sites, it said these eight may count towards our Egyptian traveller requirements. Uh, and when we put words like may in there, I get very nervous because uh, that very often means it won't. If we get full applications consented on these sites, and we're not that far off with Hounson, we've got a good chance of being able to count that as five year supply. Same with the reserve matters. Outlines much more difficult. And can we say that they need to be in phase uh, phase one of the project or not? We do try through the legal agreement on the outlines to front load the gypsy and traveller pitches as much as we can. I, we specify normally a number of dwellings to try and get them in the early phases. Obviously, they need to be located in the right, right part of the site because they genuinely need their own access, need access to utilities, things like that. So, yeah, we absolutely try and front load them as much as we possibly can. Are we liaising with people like the Gypsy Council in, in terms of the actual location of it on the site and, 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 and sort of how and when and who it's going to be occupied by? Well, this is a good point. We, we would very much like to do that, but we don't really have a, a well-organised Gypsy and Traveller community here with clear points of contact within the, within the actual community. So it's difficult to engage with them directly. So we're having to do it based on our experience of other Gypsy and Traveller pitches that have been consented in the borough and elsewhere via this mechanism. And we try and incorporate the pitches in, in the way we think is most conducive to them coming forward quickly and efficiently. Thank you, Andrew. Councillor Dillo? You're on mute. There we go. Yeah, there you go. Um, do you um, know what phase in many down the um, Gypsy and Traveller sites are being promoted into or is it being knocked back into second phase? Ruth's got a hand up for this one, Andrew. I know it's your specialist subject, so I'll let you go first. If you do know. Ruth can go for it. That's absolutely fine. <laughs> I was just going to say the Section 106 agreement requires the um, Gypsy Traveller pitches to be completed by the end of Year 5. Thank you. Councillor Vaux. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Um, could I just ask where the Dixon Road gypsy traveller site that was approved on appeal falls into this because it may not have been in the monitoring period but it doesn't seem to be included as part of the five-year supply or have I just misunderstood? Andrew go for it. Yeah that's correct we got legal advice on that one after the appeal was allowed saying we couldn't count that as part of our five-year supply because it was for a traveller from outside the borough and so wasn't meeting our local need. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Right, let's move on. The next section oh, is... Sorry, Chair. Yeah. Yes. Sorry to, to pick up on that one. A traveller from outside the borough isn't the nature of travelling. <laughs> you know where I'm going with this. And that seems a, a, a ludicrous sort of proposition. Does anyone want to answer that one? Uh, <laughs> is, is there an answer to that one? Yeah, you do. Through the need assessment, one does have to accept a degree of in and out migration with travellers, just like you do with housing. I, I, I do see the point, though. Um, and we certainly uh, were a little bit surprised, maybe with the legal advice that we got back. But there you go. We, we, we felt it was sensible to follow it. Can I just come back, Chair? Yeah, very, very quickly, please. Yeah. Um, because the appeal was allowed on the basis that we hadn't been delivering our gypsy traveller pitches. So I'm sorry, but I think you need to push back on that a little bit because yeah. that was the inspector's view. I, I would support that because I, I, I think this is a, a, a very wrong position to be taken on that one. Ruth, are you able to take a note of that? I, I, I'm, perhaps this is one we P could Pen was back. in hand. Pen was in hand. So I'll um, make a note much. of that. Yeah. Lovely. OK, uh, in the interest of time, let's get cracky on. Next section 5.4 is housing delivery through neighbourhood planning. And that's page 101 all the way through to the top of 112. Any questions or comments on that, please? Councillor Laura James. I just wanted to, if you look at the table, and I just wanted to go to... Uh, Sorry, uh, where is it? I wanted to go to Whitchurch. Not, yeah. 
so which which church which is on page 104 yes so they they look like they're going to be significant i've just chosen this one I just as a random but they look to be as if they're going to be significantly over target in relation to what they're required to meet and if i remember and i wasn't at the meeting last week that you're saying that if they have met more than whatever they've met more than will be taken off of their target next year or their requirement to deliver next year is that right yes yeah that's that's right any over delivery gets considered yeah and at this stage in relation to those sites that we've got here in relation we don't know whether they've been delivered yet or they have actually been delivered it's a mixed bag, so some have been delivered and some haven't. So we would need to continue to monitor that to make sure that the sites that we expect to come forward do come forward. So I suppose it would be quite useful in going forward that we have, a, in relation to the table, we're clearer as to what is actually, you know, in the, the list, it should be what has actually been delivered, what's outstanding. It might be useful if we had that so we know what the, the short, you know, what, what they then got to deliver going forward so everybody there's a running sort of total that we can see this is now what you've got to deliver yeah I mean the, ta the table does show what the plan of missions are and what the completions are so you do have both of those bits of information in that table this is though very much monitoring the existing plan so their existing targets it doesn't talk about what their future target will be through the next local plan because that's obviously still up for discussion right but so it it could oh, be. Sorry. Go on, Laura. Sorry. It, it could be, and I think uh, Chris Tomlin raises, it could be a minus if they've delivered more than they required in this local plan. It could, it could be minus, you know, but yeah, I see the point. It, it would just go down to zero. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. If it, yeah. So then in relation to what they had been asked to deliver, that then has to go back into the pot to be shared out somewhere again is that you know what, what i would like to understand is when will we know that how, at what point will we know that there will be a greater amount of houses to be found somewhere that we we thought that which church was going to deliver i don't know 20 i don't um, think that's the case I, th I think that that comes off the number for the whole borough then doesn't it if, if, if i'm right there joe it's, it's not so that, that shortfall it's not that excess gets allocated elsewhere it just comes off the whole borough's future target yeah well the number in the local area and such will come off their own figure but if there's an overall shortfall then yes it will go back into the overall pot but this is something that we will need to monitor as we go through the local plan process so that's yeah. obviously what we're talking about tonight in terms of the amr that's yeah. not what the AMR yeah is. i'm just just, just conscious we, we did cover this last week and give all we've still got a lot to go through I, I, if, no, if but just, can... just understanding that so people understand that this the figure here going forward, it might be that we're going to have to find a lot more somewhere down the road. At what point would we know that in our annual monitoring? Because this is an annual monitoring. How, when would, would uh, we, as a whole, know where we've got to allocate that, that number? This report is monitoring it against the local plan target that we've already got, so that this will continue to do that on a year-by-year -year basis. In terms of the future target, we will continue to update that and the figures and what the implications are of that, of any change as we go through that process. So, for example, when we bring back the report to you about spatial strategy in June, that will consider what the position is at that point. Right. That I'm, I'm going to cut us off there, if that's OK. okay. Um, and we'll move on to the final point of this section. We'll, we'll have, a, have a short break after this. Um, there's two lines which I in the table which I propose we combine, which is all to do with the design of housing monitored through building for a healthy life assessments. So this is pages uh, 112 through to 116. And Councillor Dillo, this is where it talks about some of the, the properties that were built under permitted development, which, which have failed some of these tests. So I'm, I'm very happy for you to, to go back and make your point here if you wish. Yeah, yeah it was just, I was just alarmed really, because obviously, you know, we want quality homes in the whole of Basingstoke Borough and it just seems that the whole planning system is just 
sort of run roughshod really with through permitted development I mean, there's no amenities there's no affordable housing provided the flats are too small uh, i just don't understand how we, how this can come about yeah can, can, can I, I add a point here as well just just before we we, we go to officers to, for, for an explanation and for me i, I completely share your concerns here councillor dillo and I, I mean, the, the question I had is, is when people are buying these properties and, you know, it's got the assessment here that they are, they, they scored poorly because there was you know, insufficient amenity space or the flats were too small below the, the, the lower floor space limit prescribed by the national standards. Are, obviously, this document is, is, is on the website, but you'd have to search a lot to find it. And, and most people won't. Is is this information made available to potential purchasers when they're looking at these properties to say, well, hang on a minute, what you're buying actually doesn't have enough facilities. It doesn't um, meet space standards. And, and if not, what is it that we can do as a local authority to try and challenge that? Because as, as Councillor Dillo says, it, it just seems wrong that, that, that properties that, that meet fundamental criteria, that, that fail to meet fundamental criteria are, are allowed to be sold on the open market. We don't show them that information, no. And because this system of building for healthy life is something that's sort of endorsed by um, the relevant bodies, really like Homes England and others, it's really a tool to, so the, the real purpose of it is, is to inform conversations that planning officers have with developers, also inform the development committees, that sort of thing. So it's really for the process. How we've adapted it is very much it's a local kind of informal tool that we use. It's not something official that we would tell people about. For example, we include some criteria in here, particularly for example, um, about architectural quality, which isn't actually within the actual criteria. So it's something we've developed locally. It's more for decision making, also for you as a committee and for members to see how these things are being considered how we then consider them through the local plan, you know, whether we need to strengthen policies, et cetera. So it's more a tool for us rather than mm -hmm. something that you would go out and actually publicise to, to homeowners. It, I, I understand that and I understand that it's subjective. It, it, it just seems, it, it, it seems disappointing, frustrating and unfair that, that somebody could buy a property that fails to meet these basic standards um, it's been allowed to happen, obviously, through permitted development. We're not able to stop it, but it, it just seems that, that there's no, you know, there should be a health warning somewhere. Maybe, maybe we're not the, the right people to apply that health warning, but um, it's, it, it just seems ludicrous to, to me. So I'll, I'll make that point and, uh, and move on to Councillor Gary Watts. Thank you. Yeah. Um, every year I have a rant about permitted development and I'm not going to have a rant about it this year because, you know, <laughs> Everybody else has agreed we're on the same pitch now. I mean, apart from the previous portfolio holder actually supported permitted development. It's just, in, you know, the government is responsible for substandard housing in Basingstoke and Dean. Uh, but my question was to deal with uh, the target on healthy homes. I mean, we achieved our target of 65%. Why don't we up that target to 95% or even 100%? Um, because we want healthy life homes for everybody, don't we? So I just, why don't we get it up there? Let's have a very stretched KPI. Joe? Okay. Yeah, I, mean, I, I take that on board, yes. I mean, that, that's the target that we've currently got, which is why that's reflected in the AMR. I can see why you would want to aim higher than that with a higher target. I mean, presumably that, that's something that, that Councillor Bound as the portfolio holder He's nodding his head, so that, that, that's been noted there, which is great. OK, we, we're just over two hours in, so I propose we take a break for, if we're happy to do eight minutes and come back at quarter to nine. If everyone's happy with that, we'll see you in eight minutes' time. Thank you.
All right, now welcome back everyone. We'll give it another 30 seconds or so. All right, let's get cracking again. So we have got to the start of the environmental management and climate change section. And the next line on the table is new development in strategic gaps. And that relates to uh, pages 117 and 118 in the report itself. Are there any questions and comments on that particular section. Councillor James. I, you need to unmute, please. Laurie, you're muted at the moment. Sorry, could you give me That's the pages it. one more time? Is that okay? Sorry, yes, page 117 and 118, big 117 and big 118, yeah. 101 and well, well, If we had a policy that you couldn't, you can't develop in these areas, uh, why was this allowed, really? Is it, I just, I, I'm really surprised that if we've got a policy, why are we then, in certain cases, you know, we've decided it's acceptable is a strategic gap not a strategic gap? When is a gap and gap and when is it not? Who just, <laughs> you know, that, that's really my question. I'm, I'm, yep. I'm surprised at it, really. Joe, when is a yeah. strategic gap not a strategic gap? <laughs> the strategic gap policy doesn't restrict all development in the strategic gap. So there's criteria for it. So, for example, it's about whether it diminishes um, physical and visual separation, whether it compromises the integrity of the gap, those sorts of things. So the developments that have been allowed are quite small scale. They could be, for example, um, sporting development facility for facilities and things like that. So they're not seen as really um, diminishing the gap as such. So that's why you, we've got that flexibility there with that policy. Thank you. Councillor Mahaffey. I raised the subject, thank you, Chair. I raised the subject of Greenbelt land uh, last EPH. And the answer was that uh, the problem with Greenbelt is developers leapfrog it. Is there an argument to say that having strategic gaps forces development into other areas which are equally, equally valuable but we just happen to have overlooked the fact that they're uh, a strategic gap or not a strategic gap? I, I don't think we've necessarily seen that at all, no. I mean, most of the development pressure seems to be on the edges of the villages and the settlements or around Basingstoke. I mean, you do get some, obviously, that are in the countryside. But we haven't really seen that, no. And in terms of our allocations, as you know, we sort of review strategic gaps as we go through that process. Yeah, all right. I'll take that. Thank Thanks. you. Okay, let's move on to Triple SIs and SINCSs. So that's page 118 and 119. Councillor McCormick. Thank you, Chair. How many sites of special scientific interest do we have in the borough? And I imagine we have a few more um sinks as well um are there any others um slightly um less prestigious classifications of um natural um importance that we should be aware of and uh have we got any information on developments near them i mean we have declared an ecological emergency and i at risk of repeating myself you know, we've already had significant loss of habitat and uh, species that have had um, reductions of over 90% in the past 50 years in some cases. Um, so really we're at a very um, 
late stage in, in trying to preserve our economy, ecology. Um, so it's, a, of course, for concern if we are still developing on any nature sites. Okay. So these are the two designations that we have in the borough. So the sink one is, is really quite the local one anyway. Um, so that does pick up that. Obviously, we look more broadly at green infrastructure and um, habitat enhancement and things across the board. So it's not just designated sites that we look to protect. It's, it's everything, but it's just the AMR particularly focuses on those because they are specifically designated. Thank you, Councillor James. Sorry, Chair. I, I wanted to know how many, if we had an idea, oh, how good, many good sites yes, we had. Sorry. Yes. Do we have a number off, that we can get off the top of our head or is it something we, we can um, refer back to? Yeah, we can, we can let you know that. I don't know off the top of my head. I'm sure it's in the plan somewhere. Thanks, Joe. Laura? So in relation to the sink, it was, why would we have allowed, uh, in relation to the land at Hanson Fields, the construction of an electricity substation? If, we've, if we're saying no development within these areas, why would we allow infrastructure within these areas? That's the first question in relation to that. And I was going to go on to the infrastructure. Habitat. I mean, the rationale is given on page 119 in terms of the individual applications that we, we did permit. It's considered obviously through the planning application process, so I can't really comment on that. It would have seen, been seen as a balanced decision for whatever reason the impact on, on the sink would have met the policy, whether it avoids any impact or whether you know, it doesn't impact on the sink at all. That would have been considered through that process. I think it might be, could you I'd quite like to look at the reasons why they allowed that, is if you could send us, because if we've got a policy, why would we allow that type of in infrastructure to be built on it? You know, I, I can't see how that particularly one, as an example, has been allowed to be developed. Is that, is that information already available somewhere, Joe or, or Ruth? So that's yeah, just, it's just in yeah, it's in the assessment report on the planning yeah. register, which is online or it's on the actual DC committee um, agenda papers. You can self-serve. If you don't know how to find something, we can help you find it. But it's basically part of the record, the public record, the assessment and the decision. So if you could say, okay. great, if you could just point me to it, that would be good. And in relation to the habitat, habitat enhancement okay so hang on bear we just just before we do it we, we any other questions on the triple si's and sinks no okay so we, we can move on to habitat enhancements this is page 119 to 122 so laura go for it so the target is again gray and again i think it, there should be a you know, I don't think it should be grey, to secure opportunities for biodiversity enhancement and habitat. Um, we're saying that we've done that on 16 planning applications. Does it mean that on all other planning applications we haven't achieved that? I don't know whether Robin wanted to come in with that, but I presume that that is the case, that that's actually where, yeah, this is 16 that we found where that is the case. Robin, can you can you help? Yeah, these are um, on 16 um, applications that were granted permission in the borough during the monitoring, monitoring year, and these are picked up by our natural environment team. Other um, ones have been monitored, but it hasn't gone down this mechanism of having the habitat enhancement. It will be triggered by something else on site, so um, that will be done on a site-by-site -site basis. So I'm not sort of clear. Does it mean that we haven't achieved or this is just that it's going to be achieved through monitor we have to monitor those 16 to make sure that they achieve what is required i don't quite understand what you're saying sorry sorry um these are ones that we've we've picked up and we've added a, a certain trigger to the um to the application so we will be monitoring them as and when they come through the system so um it's got the um we'll have more coming through um post monitoring period but um this states how um, how we intend to monitor it at the next stage. We've got we condition have, or yeah. section 106. So in relation to that condition on the 106, is there capacity within that team to do this work as there's more and more requirement on them to do that? I mean, that must be very time consuming. As a, I just wondered if you could tell me or if someone could send me how many 
members of staff we have within that team. Not yeah, really, that's not office, yeah, that's not for officers here to, to respond to that really because it's not within our team, it's, it's a different section. Tom's put his hand up. Yeah, Tom, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, good, good evening, everyone. So, yeah, I mean, we are very fortunate, I think, just to be able to say that in terms of resourcing in the natural environment team, we do have a lot of officers in that team. Uh, and we're blessed with officers who've got a lot of expertise in, in this field, um, which uh, is, is really, really good. So, again, as part of the budget process, you will have seen that there is additional resourcing going into the natural environment team as well. Uh, and certainly we do have the resources we need at the moment to monitor those sites. So I just want to give that reassurance, really. You tell me how many we do have within that team at the moment and how many more we're going to have as part of the budget. There is one additional officer as part of the budget process. So, yeah, I can come back to you with the figures for how many officers there are in total, if you like, in the natural environment team. I can give that written clarification afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. That'd be good. OK, let's move on. I'm going to be brutal and, and, and move on to the next one, which is the Thames Basin Heath Special Protection Area. Page one one two and page one two three. Any questions or comments about that? No. Okay, so let's move on to green infrastructure. Page one two four, one two five, and the very top of one two six. No, and then we'll move on to one which I suppose is going to be a, a subject of, of some debate and comments. Section 6.3, water qualities. This is page 126 all the way, oh, so only all the way through to 128. Um, I'll, I'll start us off here. I mean, we, we, this is obviously a point that, uh, that one of the speakers made a bit earlier, or a couple of the speakers made actually, but, but we've, we've spoken about the, the deterioration of the water quality. Uh, I appreciate that there's no numerical target a, a, a against this one, which is probably why it's grey, but it strikes me that this pro one probably should be highlighted in red, given the direction of travel is quite significantly negative. So it would just be interesting. So, so, so there is a question there, which is, um, what, why did we decide to make this one grey as opposed to red? No one's putting their hand Sorry, up. Sorry, I just couldn't what? find my mute button there. Guessing <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what walk about. Um, just for that, I mean, because because it's not numerical as such, I think that's that's the reason why, um, particularly. But I can see the point that because there has been a drop in band status over that period, that that's something that could be picked up. Thank you, um, Councillor McCormick. Thank you, Chair. Um, Page 127, paragraph 6.25, mention is made of chemicals. Every water body in England has failed in terms of chemical status uh, with various chemicals named polybrominated diphenyl ethers, perfluorooctane sulfonate. Um, I imagine there will be issues with nitrates and phosphates and all sorts of things. Um, do we know the exact reasons why the water quality of our three rivers, especially the Loddon, um, has deteriorated in the borough? Are there any specific reasons for that? Is it, in fact, increased number of days when sewage has been discharged or has it got other causes? Is it something else? It's not the number of days of sewage discharge because that's, that's a separate thing. It's the actual level of chemicals of different chemicals in the water body so that's what the EA would monitor so it'll be a whole mix of chemicals. Do we know the source of the chemicals though I mean is it agricultural is it industrial is it is it domestic Do, you know what what's the origin of it how can we rectify it? I think this is something that government is really looking into because they've just started looking at this differently so they're now monitoring chemicals in a different way to what they used to so they're looking at that in more detail and they are looking at a chemical strategy as such nationwide in terms of what can be done with that. Because a lot of these chemicals, I think it, they're just naturally in the system and they're happening more and more through a variety of reasons. So it can be agriculture, it can also be building materials. They're almost inherent in, in the environment and they've now started to monitor them. So that strategy will look to, to really 
consider what those are and what, what can be done about it so at the national level. Craven, your indulgence, Chair, I mean, I, I'm not very happy about us as a council sitting back and saying, let's let's wait for the government to fix it. What, I want to know what we can do as a council. I think we, until we know more about it in terms of the chemicals and things, it's very difficult for us to do anything about that because it's, a, it's such a big issue. And I say it's, it's a new way of monitoring as well. So we have to look at really what the reasons are that have triggered all of that. Thank you, Joe. Um, Councillor Laura James. Thank you. I, I just pick up on the, before I ask my question, but Joe, you said that in response to Andy, that the discharge into the Loddon on those 17 times had what no impact on the status of the water quality. I just, you're saying it doesn't have any status. I'm not saying it doesn't have any status, but in terms of the monitoring that's picked up here through the EA, that's not what this is. This is more the chem ongoing chemical makeup of the water within the water bodies. That's different from the sort of dumping as such of sewage at particular times. So that's a different issue. So in relation to the gauges that were spoken about tonight, if I could just understand, when were they in place? What did they monitor? And when were they removed and why were they removed? Well, they're quite detailed questions. They've been, we did um, pay for the gauges or some of the gauges and they've been in place probably two or three years, I would say. And from that, then the environment agents have been using them. So it's the EA's decision to, to not use them. You know, they, and they're quite happy not to use them because they have other means. As I said earlier, I would know the detail of that at the moment. We'd have to look into that, but that's what the EA have told us. So that like, can, can we leave? Sorry, just 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 leave that one there about the gauges because we, we have already spoken about them at length. Again, I, 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 I sound like a broken record, I know, but we have to be conscious of time. I, I, I do want to pick up just on, on the point that that Councillor McCormick made earlier about you know, what what can we do as a local authority? Um, is is this something that that we could perhaps flag to the um, the relevant portfolio holder for for the natural environment to to um, perhaps come back to us with with a response or, or, or come to a future committee? meeting and, uh, and and explain what we can potentially do, because clearly water quality is, is a massive issue. We discuss it at almost every EPH. Um, and I, I, yeah, I think it's unfair, Joe, to, to expect you to, to provide an answer. Um, but I, I think we can perhaps make a note of this is one for the portfolio holder to come in and potentially when the water cycle study is ready or, or maybe even prior to that. But I think I think it's something that we, we do need to address. And I, I think it's something that all of the committee members would be interested in, in getting the the um some answers on laura sorry i i know you want to move on from the gauges yeah. but i just want to i still don't quite understand and i thought that they were in in place we were had you know that they were in place for a longer period six years why did the environment agency want to remove them how much did it cost this borough and you know, I just would, uh, you don't have to answer it now even, I'd like it in, in writing, maybe you could write to us all, but to understand the gauges, why did they suddenly get removed? And, and were they responsible for monitoring the poo in the water? Who, who monitors that sewage in the water if it isn't picked up in other, you know, how, does, how do we pick up the beauty of water? Yeah, let's let's pick up on that one later on if we can, Joe. Because I'm, I'm conscious from your responses before that you probably don't have those those details to hand. So I think valid questions, but if, if if you can look into that by email later on, that would be hugely helpful. Okay, let's move on then to nitrate neutrality, uh, which is page one two eight and one two nine in the report. Laura, you've got your hand up. Is that? Oh, no, it's gone down. Sorry. Sorry, Thank you. No problem. Oh, it's back up. No, now no. it's gone down again. <laughs> OK, I'll assume that there aren't any questions on. Oh, and Andy, go for it. Just a quick one. Um, nitrate neutrality seems to be a big issue in any uh, body of water that's draining into the Solent, but not into the Thames. Any reason why? So that's an issue that's been picked up by Natural England, obviously because of the impact on the Solent, which is a, a European designated area. The EA um, are looking at that and Natural England more widely to see whether it is an issue that's going to affect other water bodies. But at the moment, 
they're, they're not of that view. It's just, it's just so. Okay, thank you. Um, let's move on then to managing flood risk, section 6.5, page 114, through to the top of 116. There's no planning applications on, in flood risk areas, so I'm assuming we're not going to have a deluge of questions. No. Okay, so let's move on. Section 6.6, .6, sustainable energy and water use. This is page 132 through to 134. No, nothing, which takes us on to section 6.7, air quality. This is page 135 only. Councillor McCormick. Thank you, Chair. We've had many a discussion about air quality the last few years, and I'm, I've not been particularly satisfied with any of them, if I'm honest, because we don't seem to be doing enough to uh, get a, a, a proper handle on the problem. Um, so my question is, um, are we going to start looking at particulates, especially PM 2.5s? Because in the past, um, there, there, there's been a, an element of denial in those. Um, and are we going to see any enhanced monitoring of um, nitrous oxides, uh, carbon emissions, and some of the other sort of um, vehicle-related pollutants uh, and particulates are a problem with diesels and also uh, non-combustible um, emissions things like brake dust and uh, tires and things like that it is a, a very um, extensive problem in other parts of the country um, and it has a noticeable impact on child health and, and adult health so um, I would like to know what we're going to do about it. Joe, is that something you can answer, or is that another one for the that we can ask the portfolio holder to come back to I, us on? I would imagine it's probably more Tom, but I was just going to say, okay. just in terms of sort of monitoring moving forward and looking at growth implications, it is something that will be looked at through the transport assessment as well. So future growth on the main road corridors that will be captured within that work. But Tom will know more about the shorter term. Yeah. Tom. Absolutely. I suppose just to mention, obviously, there are specific actions in the Council's overarching uh, climate change and air quality strategy, which sort of list out some of the actions, the activity we're doing to improve and address air quality. And I think when you look at the actual uh, concentration of pollutants in the borough that we monitor, you know, generally speaking, there's, there's, there's an improving picture, clearly, as the vehicle fleet uh, cleans up, as it were, and newer vehicles on the on the on the on the roads. You know, we we have seen a reduction in, in the pollution levels generally. Uh, I think the point about PM10 or two two point five, sorry, um, yeah, absolutely. You know, it is re it is reflected. It is an, it is a pollutant of concern, and obviously we just wait for the national um, guidelines, if you like, to change um, in terms of. Uh, what the expectations are, I guess, of local authorities in terms of monitoring that uh, and any actions that we uh, need to take if, if that's appropriate. So, you know, we are waiting really for a government to update their national air quality strategy um, to ensure there's a, obviously a uniform approach to that. Thanks. So is there a time frame for that new strategy? Not that I'm, yeah, I don't know, to be honest, what the, what, how quickly that's due to be released from government, but... Uh, you know, it is. It is clearly. Um, yeah, it is in train, uh, and I guess yeah. it's sort of, again. It sits, follows on from the the recently enacted environment bill in the sense that again, it's it's a key strand follow, flowing out from that uh, new legislation. Thank you. Okay, uh, section six point eight, historic environment, which is pages one three six and one three seven. Any questions or comments on that? Doesn't look like it, in which case we can move on to the next section, economic development. And we begin with employment land, um, section 7.1, which is page 138 through to 142. Any questions or comments on that? No. Okay, let's move on then to section 7.2. This is another, this is the fourth 
one of the targets that is red that, that we didn't meet in this plan period. Um, job creation, that's pages 143 through to the top of 146. Councillor McCormick. So uh, having a look at the table, page 14, it, it mentions COVID-19 and the associated restrictions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there was also an anticipated opportunity for us to have more jobs in the borough um, towards the tail end of the pandemic and shortly afterwards, when it was anticipated that people's working habits would change, that they would spend less time in the office, especially commuting to London, and uh, there'd be opportunities for local offices to be set up. But I'm struggling to see reference to that in this report. Um, it is very much a case of, oh, we've had taken a bit of a hit with hospitality and retail, and therefore we've got a red rating. Um, have I missed something there? Is anyone willing to answer that? Ruth, thank you. Um, Andrew, I think Andrew. 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 Oh, Andrew, sorry. Go for it. If, if Ruth got there first, that's fine. She's welcome to go ahead. Um, but um, but yeah, I think I think really what what that rag rating is reflecting is obviously the short term consequences, as we know, around COVID nineteen, and it's reflecting the statistical picture. I take your point. There's probably an opportunity moving forward for there to be potential changes in working patterns, and then perhaps potentially more jobs within the borough. And we'll we'll look to respond to that through the local plan update process, but I think that's going to take a while to work its way through the system, basically. I hope that helps. Thank you. Councillor uh, Tom, you've got your hand up. Just very briefly, just to mention, yes, yeah, certainly um, Ian Bowell mentioned to me, obviously, that there, there is an increasing interest in uh, office accommodation in Basingstoke, as you say, because actually a lot of businesses are looking to uh, move or relocate perhaps out of London. So we are seeing some uh, indications that that is happening, uh, as you reflected, Councillor McCormick. So, um, but also I think there's an update going to uh, CEP. I'm not entirely sure the date, either January or, or February uh, meeting in terms of the COVID update, in terms of the work that's been done by the economic development team. And again, I'm sure that more detail will be provided there in terms of the uh, actual overall position in terms of the economic recovery. Yeah, we, we, it's, it's actually our next meeting on the 27th is, is the Economic Recovery Board. So, yeah, that's, um, that's good to know. Thank you for that. Um, Councillor Mahaffey. Thank you, Chair. Just a very quick one. Talking about the change in working patterns, um, page 144, we've said that we, uh, an employee is defined as anyone aged 16 or over that is paid directly from the payroll in return for carrying out a full-time or part-time job. Um, that, given the sort of change in working patterns in the gig economy, contracting, interim work, that sort of thing, uh, that seems like quite an old-fashioned definition of what employment is. is have we got any intention of sort of updating that? Good question. Uh, how are we taking into account the gig economy? I think, and I think Andrew's probably going to come in. I think he may have a delay on him. Yeah, Andrew's got his <laughs> hand up. Go for it, Andrew. Um, not, not really a delay. It's just I was trying to think of a, a decent answer. Um, I, I think that's something we're going to have to look at, basically, because, yes, as you say, the, the nature of the employment market is evolving. And uh, I mean, that's obviously a, an external definition. And we, you know, I, I assume that comes from the something like that but yeah we, we will monitor that and if yeah if, if they update their definition to something more modern we will obviously follow suit thank you okay section 7.3 basing views this is page 146 and top of 147 questions or comments Nope, in which case we'll move on to 7.4 retail. It's page 147 through to the top of 150. Councillor McCormick. Chair, um, I'm not sure I recognise the picture there with retail. I would say that 
retail is probably a red box at the moment on the basis that if you go into Festival Place, um, then there are an awful lot of empty units, well over 10%. Um, and it's become no, more noticeable. You know, we lost Debenhams, we've lost Top Shop, Top Man. Um, we've lost a number of other units. Um, the top of town is very, very quiet. Uh, Brian Hill Retail Park has only got two units left and has just been sold and is the new owner wants to demolish it, replace it with something else. Um, so I don't think the uh, retail picture in Basingstoke is neutral. I think the retail is is red at the moment. And I think that's evidenced by the fact that we just had the Hemingway consultation on the future of the town centre. Um you know, there, there are a lot of questions requiring urgent answers um, if we're going to breathe new life into our town centre. Um, I certainly wouldn't think it's a, a neutral thing, a, a neutral box at the moment. I'd be more inclined to see that as a red box. I totally see your point, um, Councillor, in terms of vacancies and things and the increase in that, but that's not what this target is. This target is more about actual planning applications and floor space. So it relates to that, but... It, it's a very valid point. It's just not what we're monitoring. That said, I have to say that what it specifically says in the table in terms of the target is to support the vitality and viability of centres. So yeah, you can make an argument that actually um, empty units and void rates are, are applicable there. But I, I, I take your point. We'll, uh, I, won't, uh, I won't dwell on that anymore. Um, next section, 7.5, the rural economy. This is page 150 through to 155. Any questions or comments on that, please? No, I'm motoring through this bit. So that takes us on to the final element of this section, which is leisure and tourism, page 156. Not a huge amount there. No planning applications submitted. And no questions. Okay, which mean, means we move on to the final section, infrastructure. Section 8.1, page 157 through to 164, facilities and services. Any questions or comments on that, please? Right. Yeah, Councillor Laura James. So that, that talks about um, improving facilities and it talks about leisure and culture. In relation to the leisure part, can I just say, I, I went to watch Bison's the other night and how the, the, the pup went up into the air and it hit the ceiling and then a load of water came down and, the, and everyone was having to sort of dance around the water pouring out of the ceiling. And, and what are we doing in relation to improving facilities like that so I could have an update please I know we've got the leisure map coming up soon but I think that we all should know because it was so appalling that night yeah given what we've got on the agenda I, I, I'm happy to, to, to get a response on that but if we can keep that relatively brief that would be that would be good because yeah, there'll be another opportunity I hope to, to, to get a more detailed answer I think CEP are also looking into this is, is there anyone is this, who... I haven't looked at the table. Is this marked as red or do we say that all of our community facilities um, are... Well, it's, no, this is marked as grey, but I think, again, I, I suspect preempting the officer's response here, but this is, this is to do with planning applications rather than necessarily the, the condition of our existing facilities. Is um, that it's, the it's, case? It's... Is it the case that it is for planning permissions or is it about the existing community facilities? Joe, I'll, I'll, I'll let you answer because you, you know definitively, so I, I won't, won't try and uh, anticipate your response. No, you were, you were correct, Councillor, because it obviously it's a planning authority monitoring report, so yes, it's about the, the applications and things, not about the quality or, of what we've already got, which is obviously a wider corporate concern. Okay. Uh, are, are, are there any officers present who can, I appreciate this is, this is slightly off, Piste, but are there any officers who could give us a very brief update on, on the status of the leisure park and, and the ice rink in particular? 
I'm not when, seeing when, any plans. Well, sorry, just jump in. When, when you say the status of them, what, I mean, one, one thing just to mention is obviously that the provision is being reviewed at the moment as part of the local needs, um, leisure recreational needs assessment. So again, in due course, that will come forward uh, and members will then be able to see what is, uh, you know, current provision looks like and uh, and future provision and need might be in the future. So that's all I can really say on that, I think. Fair enough. Okay. Thank you. And then the final element of that is delivery of new infrastructure, section 8.2, which is page 165 all the way through to 167. Any questions or comments on that? Laura, you've got your hand up. Is that is that a legacy hand or? No, it's a yeah. legacy. Yeah. Okay, so we've made our way through the table. Um, it's 20 past nine now. Um, what we've got left to do is, is to go through the appendices, which I'm hoping isn't going to take very long, and then to discuss the um, infrastructure funding report. So I propose that we suspend standing orders and try and go through, I would say another hour to, to about 20 past 10, because I'm, I'm fairly confident, hopefully not naively confident, uh, fairly confident we we'll, we'll, would have made, every, made it through everything by 20 past 10. So is, does anyone have any objections to continuing on to, to 20 past 10? If, if you do have an objection, please just raise your hand. I can't see any. Okay, so we'll, we'll keep, keep going then. Thank you very much for that. So let's quickly go through the append appendices. So I, I, I will go through each of them in turn. Appendix one is obviously a map with lots of neighborhood plans. And then Appendix 2 lists the neighbourhood plan policies. So I'm assuming there's no comments on those, given it's a, a factual statement, um, which takes us on to Appendix 3, which is the land supply position. We've had a, a number of questions about this table already. It's been referred to a few times. Is there anything else anybody wanted to bring up about Appendix 3? Nope. Appendix four is just a list of abbreviations, so I don't propose we go through that, which takes us through to Appendix five, which starts on big page 228. And this is a list of all of the neighbourhood plans and monitoring against those neighbourhood plans. Um, there are a number of plans in there. This is it's quite a, a big document, sort of 120 odd pages. So what I'll, I'll do just very briefly, I'll just list the, um, the neighbourhood plans that are mentioned in there. And if, um, if you want to ask a question or make a comment about any of them, just, just stick up your hand. So in terms of the order in which they appear, the first one is Bramley. No, Oakley. Overton. Sherburn St. John, Sherfield on Loddon, St. Mary Bourne, Whitchurch, Kingsclear, Old Basing and Lichpit, and the final one, which I need to pronounce correctly, um, Wooten St. Lawrence with Ramsdale neighbourhood plan. No, okay, so I think in that case, we are through with the AMR. No, actually before, before I say that, I did say at the very start that um, we weren't gonna cover off the introduction, Simon, the, the portfolio holders introduction, we we're gonna say that to the end if anything wasn't covered. So. I should stick to that promise. Was there anything in that introduction right at the start of the pack? So page five through to page 14 that we haven't covered that anybody want any issues anyone wanted to raise from that? No, good. Well, in that case, we really are done with the AMR. So thank you to all I of just, the officers. Um, sorry, can I? Yes, sorry, Laura, I, I missed that. Yeah, go for it. It's just a gen general point is that this was signed off in December. Shouldn't we, as a committee, see it before it's signed off so that if we wanted to make, in a sense, it's 
this is retrospective, um, but wouldn't it be a good idea that we as a committee saw it before it signed off that if we wanted to make changes, that we could do that? I, I, I raised it this last time, and I'd like to raise it again. That's an interesting question. Um, that's probably one for the portfolio holder, I think. Simon, if you're there. I actually think it's one for Ruth as far as it's a technical document of fact. Okay, yeah, it, Ruth? It is a technical document of fact, and even if it was reported, um, uh, the fact of the matter is we actually f finish it quite close to when it's actually needing to because of the sheer amount of work that's involved in it. But it is a technical report of fact. It's not a matter for um, uh, no debate from the members is necessarily going to modify the facts and the evidence or the performance um, of these policies. It won't change the number of applications, for example, that will have received based on the policy types or the amount of floor space um, or any of those actual numerical points that are all monitored. I think that what we take the benefit from is, you know, the conversation that's been had tonight. Um, it actually, you know, we, we can um, hear the concerns or pick up the points that members have said that they'd like for next year's in relation to like the separation or clarification on types and tenures of affordable housing or similar things. And that's been interesting and we can pick that up. But actually, it's, an, it's a monitoring report of fact. And um, that's the reason why. It, it um, might be it might be a, a, a factual document, but it's the presentation of that, and so we may not, you know, we can't change the facts, but it's how that's presented, and and, and it's a quite the fact in relation to lots of documents that come before us. We can't change that, but um, in relation to the democratic process, should we not see it, you know, it's you know before it's signed off. Councillor Bound, you've got your if, hand. If I may, what I'll do is I'll, I'll speak to with the officers because we've got a, a regulatory deadline that we're trying to hit as far as the AMR, as Ruth has described. And also we've spent a lot of time this evening talking about extra information that you'd like or subsections so that that information was broken down, which wouldn't be statutory. So actually, let me talk to the officers about how we could both deliver what we need to do as far as the AMR, as far as the required information as far as performance but actually how we can see about weaving into it um the requests that you've made this evening if i'm if i can say that chair yeah that's, that's i i mean i'm not sure how we resolve this one the other the other issue that a, a few of the members have raised tonight is around the the the, the rag rating where it's gray where it potentially should be red um clearly that's difficult well it's, it's impossible to do if, if the document's already been published so i Again, if, if, if you're able to have a think about whether there's a way of giving us a heads up so we can say yes or actually we challenge you on, on this particular point, that, that would also be helpful. Thank you, Laura. Does that does that answer your question? Yeah. Great. Gary, Councillor the Watts. Um, sorry, Chair. Crave your indulgence. I've I've missed two points in the paper that I would like to bring up. Um, yeah. Could I just bring them up now, please? There'd be Swift. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, whilst, whilst we're all still here, well, one of them was on, on the, quickly. That will sorry. Be uh, additional planning for neighbourhood plans. N yes. this additional protection. Sorry. Do they to get that protection? Do they have to re um, evaluate their neighbourhood plans? That's one question to get the additional protection. Another one was on the Article Four, where the government have changed the criteria. Um, it's scaling back on what we can exclude from permitted development. Um, I, I wanted to pick that up, but I forgot. That was the two points, sorry. Just in terms of the neighbourhood plans, so they only have to show three wor years worth of supply rather than five years worth of housing supply if they meet a number of criteria. So they have to be new plans within the sort of two years of them being made. And there are other criteria as well about showing that they're accommodating growth, et cetera. So for us, it's only Burglear at the moment that's got that extra protection. Right. Just to update you in terms of the Article 4, I believe there's a cabinet report, I think it's for February, that will report back on the consultation that happened on that, because you'll you'll know that we kind of we raised the order as such. We consulted on that, and this is a, this is a smaller area now, which just literally covers Basing View rather than the, the wider yeah. area because of the changes in, in government 
guidance on that. And that would then, if that goes through cabinet, that would come into force, I think it's September of this year when that would actually be enacted. I mean, that's likely we've got less protection, we're going to get more permitted development. So, you know, <laughs> more yeah, substandard yeah. housing. <clears throat> that's the, you, you have to leave a year before the time that you designate it to when it can actually come into force. So that's why. So we've already kind of raised it, which happened last September, but you have to go through this other process before you can do that. Right, actually, on, on, on that point, uh, I'll, I'll, if I can ask the portfolio holder, perhaps for his views on, on permitted development, because I, I, I think as someone mentioned previously, the uh, his, his, his predecessor, I think, was uh, minded to, to accept permitted development. And I don't think he fought particularly hard to, uh, to, to have it pushed back in our borough. So it'd just be interesting to, to see uh, what the current I, 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 I think it's an absolutely awful thing to have in our borough when we've got so little control and impact, when we consider so carefully all of the other planning applications that we have whether that's size, whether that's facilities, whether that's the contribution to affordable housing. And I think it's fair to say, isn't it, that actually we've probably seen enough issues with those that have been developed in our borough. I, I'm always very mindful of the debacle about waste in the old Barclays office building, when actually mm. we could have told them very, well, we did tell them very clearly all the problems that were going to be there. And we all probably saw, or, or I, I certainly know people who said, you know what, actually what happened to bins and the smells outside the front door, et cetera, et cetera, and what that means for the approach of that building and whether it feels like a home, et cetera, et cetera. You know, the fact that there are, and, and, I, and I believe there are going to be some min minimum area sort of criteria going in at nationally, but actually the reality that we have no implication on it uh, and actually that somehow we'd delay it. You know, the fact that, you know, I don't believe anything that we do within our planning process is going to delay uh, a conversion of office building so that it gives people what is in effect going to be accommodation for a very long period of time. Mm. No, so, so, so can I take, take that to mean that you, you do what you can to try and push back on, on any relaxation, any further relaxation of permitted development rights in our borough? OK, thank you for that. OK, I think... Gary, you put your hand down, so I'm assuming that's it, you're satisfied yet. So I think that is it for this section on the AMR. So thank you to all of the officers um, for your time. And, and uh, it obviously, it's, it's been a three hour discussion. So really appreciate you, you staying with us to half past nine. Thank you also to, to the speakers, if there are any remaining on the call. And thank you also to you, to you the members, for your um, um, your participation. It's, it's, it's been a, a really uh, it's, it's been interesting, uh, generally, generally quite an interesting debate there. So we will move on to agenda item six in that case, which is the infrastructure funding statement. So um, we don't have any speakers for this as far as I'm aware. So we'll go straight into the introduction by the officer, which I understand is Mark Lambert, who's yeah, there you are, Mark. Thank you for staying with us. So uh, I will hand over to you. I think you might be on mute, Mark. So we can't. We can Great. see. We can see your screen, but we can't hear you. Great. Thanks. Thanks. Um, thanks, Chair. Good evening, members. Um, I've just got a short um, few slides on the infrastructure funding statement, which I'll call the IFS for, for short. Hopefully, you can see the slides okay on the screen there. Um, yeah, it's uh, as per the AMR, the Annual Monitoring Report, Authority Monitoring Monitoring Report. It's an annual requirement that we need to, to prepare an IFS. This is the second year that we've had to, to publish the document. And in a similar way to the AMR, it's a document that has to be published on the website before the 31st of December each year. It's really a very, very much a factual update on the uh, situation with regard to section 106, planning obligations around what's been received and what's been spent, and the same in relation to SIL. And I'll go through where, where we are with those two in a moment. Um, as I mentioned, it's been published online, so it's on our website. We did that just before Christmas. Um, notably this year, and in response to some comments that members made on the IFS at committee last year, um, we've tried to introduce some additional kind of case studies to liven, liven this up a bit. I think that the comments made previously was that it was quite a dry and factual document. And in that sense, it was purely responding to the regulatory requirements. So we've tried to, to, to bring in some, some case studies there to tell you a little more about what's being provided. 
Just as a, as a reminder, it's with the committee this evening for information and to note with views expressed to the portfolio to the portfolio holder. So just in terms of section 106 or planning obligations as a call, I, I'm, I'm conscious that members will probably be familiar with the tests that, that are applied to planning obligations, but just as a brief reminder, these, are these have to be are deemed to be necessary to make the development acceptable in planning terms. They need to be directly related to the development in question, and they need to be fairly and reasonably related in scale and kind to the development. And with that in mind, each planning obligation is there to mitigate the impacts of that de development on nearby communities and infrastructure. Typically, the obligations are delivered by the developers themselves, or sometimes they, they are through funding, provided to Hampshire County Council or ourselves. Just in terms of section 106s and the amount of money that's currently held, this total 6.7 million, and that is a, the total of all the planning obligations that have been received now for, for a number of years, for, for many years. Um, it, during the last financial year, 2020-21, 1.4 million was spent in delivering projects. And as I say, the, the IFS highlights some case studies of the of schemes that have been, been um, provided over the last year. So, for example, Beggarwood Park um, benefited from just over £250,000 worth of funding, which delivered a pump track for BMX, skaters and the like. Uh, also, a new play area, and landscaping benches, and bins and, and similar kind of requirements. Popley Community Park similarly benefited from £400,000 worth of funding which bought a, a teen zone with parkour facilities and junior and toddler play, as well as an outdoor gym. And elsewhere, there were, there were facilities for things like um, improvements at Carnival Hall and St Luke's Hall in, in Overton. And significantly, funding was used to uh, improve Thornycroft Roundabout, a scheme that was delivered by Hampshire County Council. The IFS also reports on um, uh, planning agreements entered into in 2020. 21, and in that sense, um, significant schemes that have been that will come forward ultimately include funding for a new primary school at, at Townsham Fields, um, £8.5 million pounds worth of funding to Hampshire for transport improvements, and other key infrastructure requirements for Hampson Fields, such as, such as a community centre, uh, allotments, and play and park facilities. Just moving on to SIL uh, or community infrastructure, and I'm conscious again the members will be familiar with this, but it was introduced back in summer 2018, and I know there was a, an early discussion around this raised by Councillor Mahaffey around when SIL is paid. But just to just to confirm that SIL is paid once the development has commenced, and it's a charge per square meter of internal floor space for some forms of residential development. I think the point was made earlier that it's a slow process to um, start to build up a sill um, pot. Having only introduced sill in 2018, there was no income in the first year. But in 1920, we received just over £100,000 of income. And then last year, it was just over half a million pounds worth of income. So you can see it's a pot that's beginning to build up now. Um, I'm sure, again, you'll be familiar with the fact that there's an amount of sill is passed to town and parish councils where development has taken place. And in the last year, just over £40,000 was passed on. The amounts are paid twice a year to, to the parishes as required. So a payment every six months. Um, and that's used generally to, to fund infrastructure in the local area. Notably, in 2020-21, uh, no sale was spent by the Borough Council. Look, looking ahead, the report also touches on how you know, infrastructure provision will be taken into account in preparing the new local plan update. And it's useful to be aware that we will be preparing a new infrastructure delivery plan to accompany the local plan update. And you'll, you'll see that during the course of this year. Notably, we have to undertake a strategic viability assessment of all the policies and the sites that are coming forward in the local plan update. And that's to make sure that development can be delivered viably. And at the same time, we will be undertaking a review of the SIL rates to ensure that these align with the uh, allocations to be made in the lo new local plan and they respond to changes that have happened in the market and the economy generally. Just as a final reminder, Chair, the um, 
the recommendation is to note contents of the report and to um, pass on any views to the, to the um, portfolio holder who's here this evening. Thank you very much, Mark. That's great. And, and yes, I remember the conversation from last year about um, making the, the trying to make the document more engaging, um, should we put it diplomatically. And um, it, it, I remember when, when I first got this pack, it was yeah, it's quite clear that a lot of effort has gone into to trying to do that. So, um, so that's one of the things I would like to note. OK, um, once again, I propose that, that we skip the introduction. Um, so that's pages 353 to page 361 for the time being and we actually look at the document itself so that starts on page 364 really of the of the main pack and go through it section by section um before i do that i notice that councillor vaux has her hand up so councillor do you want to uh you want to make a point and make a comment um and it does come from the introduction so i apologize chair is that going to be a problem well let's if, let's let's see if we tackle it elsewhere and if we don't we'll come seen back it elsewhere it. that's the trouble <laughs> okay go on then go on then. okay so it, it, in the summary it talks about uh, on 311 on page 357 and i apologize if it is in the main document and i just haven't been able to find it it talks about the amount of sill received in 2021 58 seven eight five one and uh, no associated spend to date i i wanted to ask how much flexibility there is in where sill monies are spent because i'm acutely aware that redlands which is being built at the moment and may well it might their sill might be in this i'm not quite sure because of where when it started where it fell um their, their sill has been allocated to the east of Basingstoke, which hasn't been built, um, isn't likely to be built at the moment, I'd say. Um, and all, all the community facilities that those people will be accessing are actually Sheffield Park and possibly Chinham. So is, this, is there flexibility about where this sill is spent or does it have to be spent where it's allocated right at the beginning? No, the, the, the SIL has much more flexibility than Section 106 and planning obligations, and it can be it, it can be spent generally in the borough to meet to meet infrastructure requirements. Okay. There's a list in the in an appendix to the IFS. Um, I haven't got the page number quite in front of me, but that that spells out broadly speaking where it's intended that SIL will be spent in the future. But at this, this stage, no decisions have been taken on exactly how that SIL pot will be spent down the line. Okay, so so on, on that point, Mark, if, if, if there are councillors who would be interested in getting still money for their wards, how, how would they go about making you aware of that? Or, or, or can they do that? Is, is, is that the pro are, are we able to flag up and say, actually, we've got this area here, which would really benefit from this investment? That's not a formal process that's in place yet, but it very, it very much needs to be led by the, the evidence base So and the the studies that we have in place and various strategies. So, for example, the leisure and recreational needs assessment will tell us where the key requirements are in terms of leisure and sport. So I think we need to be conscious of what the evidence is telling us in that sense and then um, aligning our sales spend with that uh, down the line as the pot continues to evolve. And of course, we need to be mindful as well of the content of the infrastructure delivery plan and also the council plan priorities, because we need to kind of be merging these these, these things together and forming an overall view. OK, so, so actually, so if councillors were looking at getting the funding, the, the way to do it would be to, to look at the evidence base, such as the legend needs assessment, maybe the, the, the cycling or walking infrastructure plan and sort of saying this is this is highlighting that this particular ward could do with this investment and and, and leaving you guys then to, to, to reach a conclusion. I think there's there's that, and there's also thinking about the the capital program that sits part as part of the budget setting process each year. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, um, so let's go through the the actual document itself. Then, starting on page three six four with the executive summary. Any questions or comments on that, please? No. In which case, we'll move on to section one introduction on page three six five. Section two, um, I'm going to split this up into two. So uh, it's page 366, 367. So we'll start with section two with the section 106 agreements. Any questions or comments on the section 106 agreements? 
No, anything on the sill on page 367. No, okay, so let's move on to section. Oh, Councillor McCormick, sorry, I missed that. Go for it. Yeah, so um, we'll get on to in a minute particular areas that, uh, you know, so, some seem to have done better than others with SIL. Um, but why have we got a zero SIL rating for Winklebury and Manydown? That links back to the original piece of viability work that was undertaken a few years ago when we first set the sill rates and that there's a detailed kind of viability model that sits behind that. You recall when I introduced the paper, I said that we would be looking at the, um, with the new local plan update, uh, a process of undertaking review of the sites and the policies to see how they stack up in terms of viability. That work was undertaken for the existing adopted local plan a few years ago. It, it was along the same lines. It assessed all the costs and uh, values associated with development. And it came to the view on the back of uh, evidence provided to us that they were unable to support a sill rate. That was tested through, a, through an examination with a, with a planning, planning inspector and was the outcome of that process. OK, thank you, Mark. Let's move on to section three then. Um, and we'll begin with the section 106 agreements in the case studies, the pages 368 and 369. Any questions or comments on that, please? No, let's look at the, the list then of community facilities on page 370. Does anyone want to make any points on that? No. The community infrastructure levy on page 371. Councillor McCormick. I guess it has to be said, but page 370, I assume that that's, uh, the, the, the previous stuff was section 106 and section 106 has got area constraints. Um, there are, there do seem to be concentrations of you know, quite substantial sums in town centre, Rooksdown, Overton, Chinham, Kempshot, Beckerwood, Hatch Warren, that sort of area. Um, what about the areas that don't see that sort of spend? And I'm thinking places like Brighton Hill and South Ham that have had hardly any Section 106 because they've had hardly any big build schemes next to them. Um, they don't appear to have had that much in the way of sill spend either. How can we as a council rectify it. We were talking about collecting the evidence. Well, I mean, that to me seems pretty strong evidence as to where we should be directing our sill spending. It, it's probably worth saying, <clears throat> excuse me, that's the, the table on page 370, a list of the schemes, as, as you rightly say, that have been funded through 106. So those schemes are there to mitigate the impact of new developments. So they are kind of consuming the smoke of new development in that sense. So if there hasn't been development taking place in the, in the local area, then there won't be a need to increase the size of a community hall, for example, because there shouldn't be an increased population to, to, to deal with. So that, that explains why you won't find SIL expenditure, uh, sorry, 106 expenditure in some of the areas not, not listed. Obviously, I mentioned earlier that SIL hasn't, we haven't spent any SIL money as yet, and that's a decision to be taken down the line. So something that we can bank and be, be aware of but obviously we need to be focusing SIL spend where infrastructure need is, is most, um, most highlighted. Okay, thank you, Mark. Um, let's move on to the two tables and table A, table B. Now, um, having, having spoken to, to Mark in advance of this meeting, um, he's made it quite clear. Uh, I think we can probably work this out for ourselves, but these tables are presented in a very particular way to, to comply with, with the government regulations. So the numbers aren't necessarily that particularly useful to us. They are they are there so that um, our reporting is consistent with with everybody else in the country. But nonetheless, um, with that caveat in mind, are there any questions on either table A or table B? Bearing in mind the numbers might not be that useful, or that relevant to us because of uh, the, the the reason they've they've been included. Gary, Councillor Watts. Yes, 
three seven five the nearly a million pound on affordable housing is is that offset money um where development didn't want affordable housing um and that's just gone into a pot um could you just give us a bit more detail on that please I would have to liaise with colleagues in housing to give you an answer, but I imagine you've you've highlighted the correct reason there. But let let me confirm with colleagues and get back to committee. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Gary. Any other questions on the tables? Nope. Okay, let's go on to Appendix One, the infrastructure list. Councillor Vaux. Uh, thanks, Chair. I, I think I asked the same question last year. Um, Appendix one, the infrastructure list, when does this get reviewed and updated? Uh, and, I, and I'm looking specifically, as I think we also talked about last year, the transport section, which has in it provision of an A33 link to Cuffold Lane, Chinham Distributor Road, which was not built when it should have been built, um, but is still there. Um, and the construction and implementation of Chinham Railway Station, which again, you know, was intended to be there, but isn't there. But I, it just seems strange that they remain here. I mean, are they there because there's genuine belief that they will happen or is it just historical and we never take things off? Just picking up your first point around reviewing the list, I, I mentioned earlier that we would be undertaking a review of the sill rates as part of the local plan update in time. I think when we do that, we'll also take a fresh look at the infrastructure, infrastructure list to see what components should be on there, what should be funded by section 106 and what should be supported by SIL uh, in the future. Picking two particular chin focused items, the, the link road through Sheffield Park um, first. That is an historic kind of point, I think, because looking back at the, the history of the site, um, I believe it had been intended uh, when the site was conceived 10 or 15 years ago, that would be provided through a section 106 planning obligation. But for various reasons around the, the site, um, and in, in a bit more detail, I believe that the view was reached that the road wasn't required. And it, it was al it's almost a political conversation we had with members back in the back at the time that they didn't want to lose sight of this, this potential for a link road. I think that the view was reached that it should be included as a sill item, just so we don't kind of lose sight of it down the, down the line. And then picking up yeah. the... Um, sorry, do you want to... Do you want to yeah, if I could just... very it, we're, it, late it. In, we're late enough, so we won't take too much of your time. But one of the issues that we now have is with the opening up of Cuffold Lane, end of this of Sherford Park, Rockbourne Road, the main arterial road now, was not designed for traffic, for the volumes of traffic that we're now getting. Whereas that link road was, if that makes sense, the road's to the link road have been designed on to because it's basically half yeah. of the road to go out to Cuffield Lane. Um, so now we have lots of problems with that. So on, on the one hand, it would be quite good if it was left in there, but it feels like it, it, it's passed, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yep. So I just wanted to make that point. So, thank you both very much. Let's um, move on to Appendix Sorry, he, he, oh, sorry. Uh, Mark, yeah. Mark was going to say about the railway station. Oh, yes. Apologies. Sorry, Mark. Yeah. Chinham Station, of course, this is a, uh, an allocation in the existing adopted local plan and one that is still there in the background as a site that may have potential for a station. Mm -hmm. Of course, studies haven't been undertaken for a number of years on it to see if it's got any legs to move it forward. But I think the view has always been that let's not lose sight of it again. Let's keep it in, in the frame. Uh, for, for potential spend in, in the future, should there be a business case that supports its delivery. Okay, thank you. Thank you, yes, we, we, we could go into more detail on that one, but I, I don't think we will, given it's almost 10 o'clock. Okay, so Appendix 2, planning obligations secured during the, the last financial year in relevant Section 106 agreements. Any questions, any comments there on any of those projects? Councillor Mahaffey. Yeah, very quick one, please, Chair. Um, yep, go for I'm it. quite interested in school travel plans and how we can sort of uh, uh, car sharing, make them more eco-friendly, that sort of thing. Could somebody just tell me what the school travel plan actually is? Thank you. 
uh, there's a team at Hampshire who deal with school travel plans and they work hand in hand with each of the schools uh, in the vicinity where there's a, a development coming forwards. So the money would be used to work uh, with Hampshire County Council and the school concerned to develop that plan and to, to achieve a more effective way of kids arriving at school without perhaps having to use a car. Um, if you'd like a little bit more information on school travel planning and the function of Hampshire, I'm happy to drop your line outside of the meeting, customer happy. Yeah, please, if, if you could, I'd be grateful. Thank you. I'd like to talk Thank about you, that. Simon. Okay, before we wrap up this, were there any additional questions or comments about the introductions of page, pages 353 to 361? Anything we haven't covered that you would like to ask or have made note of, please? No. Okay. In which case, thank you very much, Mark. Really appreciate that. Um, we move on to the review of the work program. So I, th I think most of the officers now you're you're off the hook. And thank you again for for your time this evening, and uh, I'm sure we'll see you again soon. And off they go. Okay. So the final item for us, given there's no exclusion of press or any confidential exempt items, is the review of the work program. So it's been a busy January. It's been something every every Thursday in January for us. Next Thursday is obviously the full council meeting. And then the Thursday after, on the 27th, we've got our next EPH, our third EPH of the month. And on the agenda, sorry, I should step back a little bit and say, hopefully you will receive the updated um, work program that was emailed over by Julia yesterday. Um, if you haven't, um, please shout. We'll, we'll make sure you get a copy sent. But um, that says that on the 27th, so in two weeks' time today, we've got two items on the agenda. It's the Economic Recovery Board. And this is something that, that we alluded to earlier about um, looking at how the borough is rebounding from, um, from the pandemic and, and the restrictions that were imposed last year. And also there'll be a presentation at long last from the LEP. Um, oh. So we can quiz them about about what they do and their plans. So uh, that should be worth attending. The next session, then we, we actually get a week off, um, amazingly. And then we don't come back until the 10th of February, where the green the housing green conversion motion, which um, I know was passed by full council almost a year ago, will be tackled, as well as the COVID-19 motion, which um, which I think was was put forward at the same time. And then we've got one more session this municipal year, which is the next local plan update. So I think that will that will keep us busy over the next couple of months. Is there any, anything that anyone would like to add about the work program? Any comments, questions, concerns, issues on that? I think he wants the, the portfolio. Is, is Simon Bound still here? I'm not sure he is, but anyway. No, yes, he's so, opted. Um, he's, he's, no, he's left the meeting. That, that's well, I, I, we can always pass those messages on. So, uh, Laura, you, you were first off the mark. You, you, you beat Councillor Dillo to it just by a, a fraction of a second. It was just um, in picking up on the some of the reports. I know that we've got a busy time coming here, but in future work programme, I'd like us to look at some of the documents that were mentioned in the annual monitoring report. So... Uh, in relation to like the, it's been mentioned a lot tonight in, in relation to questions which was the leisure and recreational needs assessment and we've got within that uh, document it's on page 44 of the AMR but there's um, got the water cycle study we've got yeah the landscape there's a whole list of them and really some of those documents uh, and, and the reports that have been produced, we really should see at this committee and, and be able to discuss in some detail. Okay, no, thank you for that. Julia, obviously I, I'm not the, the permanent chair, so I, I can't make a decision on that, but Julia, are you able to, to make a note of that so we can um, you can raise that with, um, with Stuart when he returns? Uh, yes, I've got that. Brilliant, thank you. And uh, Councillor Dillo. Uh, just very quickly, at what point will we know these future meetings, whether they be virtual or in person, just for logistics? Uh, good question. Um, I don't know. Um, 
a democratic service. Oh, Tom, Tom's face has appeared on screen, which hopefully means he has, he, he knows more. Oh, I wish you did. Uh, uh, probably my guess is as good as yours. Obviously, government re re reviewing the current restrictions. I think it is, is it the 27th of Jan? 26th. Um, yeah. 26th. Um, and in which case, you know, what we're what we are seeing, I think, in terms of case numbers is that we, we are we are seemingly just uh beyond the peak, uh, thankfully, and therefore uh, case rates are beginning to fall, which is really positive. You know, our our view, this is only basically officer view, if you like, is that looking at that. You know, we're quite optimistic that those restrictions will potentially be relaxed uh, come that point. So, you know, as soon as the government changes those restrictions and, and, you know, we are back to a position where, you know, working from the offices, for example, is um, advised again, then, then I'm sure we'll go back to uh, uh, meetings in person. Good, because I know that, that some committee, I think DC is, is one example, have been meeting actually in the council chamber, but obviously with, as, as there's fewer of them, there's, um, it, it works quite well from the social distancing perspective. So it would be, it would be good if, if something like that could be, could be considered for us as well. So, okay, so, well it's, so possibly the 27th. Would that Not immediately on the 27th, we'll have to obviously wait to see what the government yeah. actually announced. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> shortly after that, once we know what the changes are, yeah. then then I think there's clearly a desire, isn't there, to 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 go back to face to face meetings as soon as we can. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Thank Tom. You. Thank you, Sean. Right, it's bang on 10 o'clock. Any final comments? No, everyone's shaking their head. I think uh, three and a half hours is, is probably sufficient. So thank you all for your time. Thank you for, for staying with us and, and, and for all your questions and comments. Really are appreciated. Um, we'll, uh, obviously, minutes have been taken. We'll make sure that those all those points uh, that were raised and which answers were going to be promised after the meeting are actually delivered. And, and, and if anything doesn't happen, please feel free to, to contact me either by email or by phone and, and I'll make sure that they are chased up. But thank you again for your time. Thank you. And hopefully see you again in person next week. Great. Thanks a lot, Andy. Bye. Thanks a lot. Take care. Bye. Bye.